Peace and blessings, family. This is your brother, Asaf Hermhotep, with the Martin Delaney Center for Egyptology. And today is Sunday, June the 25th, 2023. And we have with us a very special guest, Brother Sekou Kela, a frequent guest uh, on our program. Uh, but this time, you know, he is our special guest. So we're going to get into his life. We're going to talk about African Renaissance and what that means and much more when we return in just a moment. Sorry, I don't have uh, my light and excuse the uh, noise in the background. I'm at a, uh, uh, I had to stop by a cafe real quick. And so uh, here I am. So I'll try to keep my mic on mute as, as much as possible uh, throughout this conversation. So just wanted to first and foremost give a shout out to everyone who has made themselves known in the chat. And we have. Uh, Sister Mika, peace and blessings to you. We have Leo uh, Vinzen or Vinzen. Uh, hopefully, you can uh, correct me on you know uh, how to pronounce your name because I'm surely messing it all up. Uh, we have with us Sister Safa in the building. Peace and blessings to you. Uh, Teti Ursa Maat Ross and Neferu is in the building. Rich the African Elder is in the building. Uh, Kogotso in Botswana is on time. Yes, you are. Uh, thank you for coming in uh, and joining us today. Brother Sean P is in the building, and so is Sister Sh Sherry Jones in the building. Oh, we got one more. We got Learn to Dig Two Pits. Uh, we'd love to know what that means. Learn to Dig Two Pits. Uh, you know, peace and blessings to you. Oh, and Ace, oh, AC1 and Geoff Taharka is in the building. Thank you all for joining. And of course, those of you who are joining from uh, Facebook and from um, Twitter, you know, peace and blessings to you all as well. So, you know, before we get started, of course, we have uh, just a few announcements. So uh, if you haven't gotten your copy of Muntuan Zombie uh, by Dr. Chilin Malima Mukinge, I would encourage you to do so today. Uh, you can go to maduandelapress.com uh, and get your copy and or you can go to uh, amazon.com and get you a copy there. And you can go to Asar M. Hotep to pre-order the new text, Race and Identity in Ancient Egypt, Volume 1, Towards a Meaning for the Place Name Kemet. And uh, thanks and love to all of those who have uh, made their pre-orders already. And I hope you're enjoying the sample chapter. And uh, I look forward to getting your feedback once the book is released on August the 22nd. 2023. So, uh, and again, you can get that at asarmhotep.com. And so without further ado, I want to bring, oh, well, first I got to get this off. Okay. It was being stubborn there. Um, and I see he's on here twice. So I'm going to go with the one that has the video, the video 
and see if that works. Um, our good brother Seku, can you hear me? Your mic is muted if you, if you are. Yes, peace and blessings, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I can hear you well. Peace and blessings. Thank you for yeah, I'm on me. there twice. I'm sorry. You said I'm in there twice. Yeah, you're. Um, oh, my bad. That's a slideshow. Never mind. Yeah, uh, I think that's you said. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, um, well, welcome. You know, to uh, the platform once again, and. Um, for those who are, are unfamiliar with you, can you give us a little background of uh, who you are, uh, what do you do, where are you from, and what got you interested in, in that African stuff, so to speak? Right. So thank you very much. My name is Seku uh, Malik Kele. So I was born in Liberia. Uh, I'm a Liberian, so um, born obviously in the Madinga ethnic group and uh, Muslim family, where we, you know, grew up pretty much like every average Muslim learn about Islam and how our entire life is tied around that religion. So I've been in Africa all my life. I knew a little bit about Pan-Africanism until I traveled out of the continent in the year 2013. I got to Europe in Italy. So from there, I got exposed to the outside world. I started meeting different people. And I began to realize that there is a lot out here that I was not told. So I began to have so, ask so many questions. So I, be, I came across so many videos on the internet, started reading. And I began very interested in reading a lot about African history. After I left the continent, while I was on the continent, everything I read about was Islam and how I needed to pray five times a day and keep all the rules of the religion. But then when I got out the outside world, I discovered that there is a lot of challenges out here that I needed to go past the religion. So I came to Canada a few years back and I went to college. I studied social work. Uh, I'm a social worker. I'm trying to go get a degree in philosophy soon. I'm trying to prepare for that. So my greater interest today is African Renaissance because having read about Pan-Africanism, having read different theory about African people's struggle, and I feel that African Renaissance is the new face of our revolution and of our struggle. And I believe that we all needed to rally around that idea because it is the new face of Black revolution globally. I appreciate it. Thank you. And um, given that you have a slideshow, I don't know if you will be answering this on the slide, uh, but I'll take a chance here. And, and when you're talking about an, an African Renaissance, what, what, does, what do you mean you know, by that? Uh, you know, like, like, what's the what's the overall goal of, of the African Renaissance? Right. So I have, I have a few slides that could have answered these questions. So I don't know if I can use that opportunity to to go. Yeah. Thank you very much for putting the slide up. So first of all, I start with the Juneteenth uh, celebration, and I wish freedom and happiness to all our brothers and sisters in the United States. This, uh, my, that's my son. He's four to five years old. He said, I paused my game to, to celebrate Juneteenth. So he's sending out love and greetings to all of you out there. His name is Sunjata. I named him after the Mali Empire Emperor, first emperor of Mali, Sunjata Keita. So we, we send our greetings out there and we recognize this date being an important date of our people who got the uh, Emancipation Proclamation very late. They were kept by the evil one and eventually got free. So that's just the intro there. So I'll have to move quickly to the issue of Renaissance. So Renaissance, when you hear about it, the first thing you we all know is the European Renaissance because we are speaking English, obviously. So that's where it, 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 it kind of boils down to in the beginning. If you first come across the world, even if you type it on the internet, this is what is going to show up. 
So they say European Renaissance means European rebirth. The Renaissance began a period of about renewing uh, interest into the classics of European history, that's Greece and Rome. So it was characterized by learning, literature, art, and style. So, but what we are discussing today is not the European Renaissance. It is the African Renaissance. So that means we have to find the word for it or the concept how, how whether it exists in African uh, culture or languages or not. So that's what I will do very quickly before Brasa will lead to the next question. So uh, we have the term Sankofa, so everybody is familiar with from Ghana. It means go back and get it. So this term uh, in, from West Africa is usually refer, you can see the symbol on this, what explain it all, because African use a lot of symbols to explain their concept. You see a mythical bird looking behind to fetch his egg. So the bird looks back to fetch his egg and obviously take the egg into the future. And the term itself means go back and get it. So what does, why does the, the, the um, does the bird goes back to get his egg? Obviously, we know the bird itself came out of the egg. So it's going back to get its origin, to bring it into the future. What that pretty much says, the, there is something the bird has left behind, something very important that is useful to its present and its future. That's why it goes back and reach out for that, uh, uh, that egg and bring it into the future. That's the concept of Renaissance. It is to go back, to get something that you have lost throughout history, something that got missing or that were omitted or that were brutally taken away. You go back and get it for the purpose of moving into the future. That's the purpose. It's not to stay there. It's not to remain there. The purpose is to move into the future. The next one we have is from Kemet itself. It is Smataiwi symbol. And this here, I don't read the 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 the, the, the hieroglyphic, but I can read the what I, I can read here is the name in the middle there is Ka uh, Kepe Ra. That's the name of the king in the Shenu or in the in the in the Katush there. So these two uh, deities are standing there posing for the symbol the Kosmatawi. That is the union of the two lands. But they are holding something, the papyrus plant, and they are tying it around what they call the, 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 the uh, uh, how they call it, the jet symbol, which is kind of the backbone of Asar. And they are holding it very strong, making it stable. And the name of the king itself that we see there is Ka Kepe Ra. And that is an, it's an important name because we see the, the Kepe Ru there, which is coming into being, the, the beetle come into being and we see the sun, which is the rod right there and sun being uh, the symbol of new dawn. So they, this unity or this uh, union of the two land in ancient Egypt was not just a mere word of unity as we, as we, we talk about it. For them it's coming into being and reborn, being reborn, coming back alive. This is all this, this is, a, that's, that's, that's what they see it to be. So it is the bringing the land and the people and everyone there, bringing them back into life, back into existence, back into being. So this here explains or justify the, uh, the concept of what we call Renaissance in African culture. So now the definition for it in modern literature is what I'm going to go to before I let Asa ask the next question. So. Oh, okay, my bad. This is going to take a while to explain all of this. So um, I have to enlarge the screen a little bit. Can I continue, Asa, or you have more questions? Would you like me to continue? I, I just want to go, uh, if you can go back to the, the previous slide. Okay. So the, the only thing that I would add is that it would it would more than likely be Kepper Kara in terms of the name itself. And that um what you call the Dejed, you wouldn't be you wouldn't necessarily be wrong um when it when it comes to that because it's it's kind of used doubly in that same sense. 
Um, but this is actually a hieroglyph itself of the trachea, uh, the lungs. So this is what you would you would use to read the word Sima when they say Sima Tawi, the union of the two lands, that word Sima or Simer, um, that's that's what that that symbol is there. And given that it is the, the trachea and is dealing with, you know, breath and life, in many respects, we could possibly interpret this as, you know, uh, because of the union, these these two sides balancing each other out and um, that they're strengthening the life, they're strengthening the health, you know, of the entire country itself. And so, you know, that's not an official interpretation, but, right. you know, that is that is something that, you know, when when I look at it, that that comes to mind um, like that as well. But um, but yeah, I mean, you, you can continue. And, and, um, yeah. And even I think at the, the Temple of Anu, they, they, they have a word. I don't know the original source for it. It's Seruj. Seruj. Yeah. So Seruj they, is uh, uh, the restoring the, the uh, restoring of the land. Yeah. Of the land. So these concepts already existed. The concept of all renewing or rebirth or coming back to life or going back to get it is what explains, uh, I believe, when you go into traditional literature of Africa, you can find this term can also be linked to what Renaissance is. But in terms of it, modern usage, it comes from Dio. And so yeah. that's what I want to go to and get into the proper explanation. Go ahead. OK. So the, the things I will be discussing today is what I just highlighted here. Uh, so no, let me go I'm before sorry. I get to yeah. I'm, I'm sorry to break you. Uh, just let me know if you need me to make it full screen or not. If 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 you like, I could do that as yeah, well. On my side is full screen. If you want to do it, you can go ahead for me. I made it full screen on my side so that I can read it. So All if right. you can make it full screen for the people, you can do that as well. Okay. All right. So uh, before we discuss African Renaissance, it is important to discuss uh, what I call African pioneers or African schools of thought, because there are so many schools of thought on the continent uh, beginning from 1950, 1960 until our time. And it is this school of thought that birthed the idea of African Renaissance later on. So one of the pioneers of African schools of thought is Edward Wilmot Blyden from 1832 to 1912. So Blyden uh, actually wrote the book, Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race, that you can see on the screen. If anyone has never read this book, you can read it. It's a little bit uh, disjointed if you read this book. The book is kind of um, it's different lectures he delivered over the years. I think it's what well been compiled into a book. So if you are reading the book, sometimes there is a disconnect between the chapter to another, but generally the book deals with this subject, Christianity, Islam, and the Negro race. In that book, by uh, uh, Blyden, who immigrated to Liberia in the 1950s from the Caribbean, he was not born in Africa, he was not born in Liberia, but as of 1850, he felt that Liberia was the only free place in Africa where black people can actually go and be safe. Why slavery ended a few, uh, few decades before, but there were still skirmishes here and there. Slavery was still going on here and there. And Blyden felt that the safest place he could be is Liberia, a newly found state by African-Americans and the West Coast of Africa. So Blyden arrived there and having looked at the continent and went through so many uh, travel around West Africa and saw different cultures, Blyden talked about Ethiopianism a search for a collective history and identity of black people. He saw that there is a need for a concept he called Ethiopianism. So he looked at Islam and Christianity and he criticized Christianity on so many levels, probably due to the missionary activities and also the way the missionary have a contradiction. On one hand, they were preaching the love of Jesus Christ. And on the other hand, they were racist and white supremacists and they were walking along with the colonizer to colonize the continent. So Biden said this contradiction in the white man's ideology, it cannot be reconciled. So Christianity is a prob will be problematic for African future. So for Islam, he gave Islam a little pass at that time 
because he felt that the Muslims he met in West Africa were actually practicing the religion by themselves without Arab intervention, even though he doesn't know that something was of a core prior to that. But so he gave Islam a pass on that level. But there's something important that we must look at here is blinding talk of Ethiopianism. He said in the earlier tradition, reading now from 193 chapter of the book, in the earlier tradition of nearly all of the most civilized nations of antiquity, the name of this distant people is found. The annals of Egyptian priests were full of them. The nations of Inner Asia and the Euphrates and the Tigris and the interwoven the fictions of the Ethiopian with their own traditions and of the conquest of wars of their heroes. And at the period equally remote, the glimmer in the Greek mythology. When the Greeks scarcely knew Italy, Sicily by name, Ethiopians were celebrated in the verses of their poets. They spoke of them as the most just men, the favorite of the gods. Lofty inhabitants of Olympus must join in to them and take a part in their feast. Their sacrifices are the most agreeable to of all the mortals that can offer them. So what Blyden discovered, Blyden found that despite the racism in Europe, despite the, the slavery and the colonialism that's about to take place on the continent, and all the literature that were out there in trying to demonize black people, Blyden said, if you go back enough into Greek texts, what they call classical text at that time. He said, you find only sing praises about black people, quote unquote, Ethiopians. So Blyden said then, there is something about our past that needed more investigation. There is something about our past that needed to be uncovered because how come the classical text talks about Ethiopians so highly and today, European books are trying to denigrate black people. There is a disconnect in our history. How is it that the Greek gods in Olympus must travel to Ethiopia on pilgrimage to go and renew themselves? So if that can happen, there must be something about Ethiopia. So Blyden literally laid down the groundwork. And some even call him the father of Pan-Africanism, even though he didn't use the word. He used the word Ethiopianism. And from Blyden, the birth of this type of thought will now accelerate. So three schools of thought emerge in Africa from the 1950s downward. One is called the Negritude. The second is called the Triple Heritage. And the third one is what people now call Afrocentric, which is African centered. The Negritude movement, very briefly, is Black essentialism. For them, it was started by Leo Damas from the Caribbean as well. And you have Leopold Sedar Senghor. He's on the screen here on the bottom left. Leopold Senghor was the first president of Senegal. And there was also Aimé Césaire from also the Caribbean. These three men were the pioneers of this school of thought called the Negritude Movement. For them, they were celebrating blackness. But their celebration of blackness is being characterized as what they call black essentialism. So that black people have certain unique qualities and characteristics unique to them, which needed to be celebrated as their culture. So they also call for universal civilization, that in as much as Europeans uh, present themselves as the head of civilization in the world, they argue that civilization has to be global, it has to be universal, so that black people can come also and make their own contributions to civilization. So these men did not take into account African history very much. They didn't take into account what characterized negritude in terms of black people's culture. For them, it was kind of opposing it towards European prejudice and European way of looking at African culture. So they were writing poems to praise blackness, to praise black people. But there was something very interesting about their philosophy, which has been criticized. One of them called Leopold, he said, emotion is Negro and reason is Greek. So by that conclusion, he meant that white people were giving with rationality, but emotions is actually a natural gift of black people. So, Emotion to his understanding then is higher than reason 
and then reasoning or logic with the Greek had a devoid of emotion and it leads to a catastrophe. But so so uh, not to interrupt you, but yes. so what you're saying here is that uh, that you know while they did uh, you know kind of praise blackness in a sense. Yeah. You know, their their overall worldview was not grounded in the traditions from which they were they came from and were born. Absolutely correct. All right, go ahead. It was sort of reappraisal of Western culture to say Western culture, look, this is your this is where you were mistaken. This is where trying to correct white ideology using their own blackness, but it was not really. They're going in depth into their own history and culture and bringing out a philosophy. This was kind of a reactionary to white racism, essentially. So that's why they came with this sort of idea to say emotion is Negro and reasoning is Greek. Now, if you go back and read many European literature, you find those same terminologies being used. And they don't use it exactly that way. For example, in Blighting, book, you will find a, a, a reverend, I think Reverend Leotan, who says that he has been to West Africa, that he don't expect the black man to achieve the creativity and the industrial enterprise of the white man. However, the black man has some qualities. He is, he is a, a social, he is nice, he, he loves religion, he's very spiritual, he's not... In the in other world, he's using the same thing that reasoning is Greek or white and emotion is Negro. So this is, and also even uh, M. S. Césaire, who happened to be one of the greater intellectuals of this movement, he said, we come from a people who have built no boat, who have sailed no ocean. But we have, uh, I don't know what he said, we have love, we have kindness, we have this. So later on, scholar will say no this is very wrong this is this is validating white supremacy in another sense using black it's like we are not accepting the position in which the white supremacy have put on and say we accept that we have never built anything we have nothing but at least we will evolve this is kind of an apology to whiteness this is what a negritude can be criticized to, to that level the next one is called a triple heritage the triple heritage was the man up there on the top right. He's called um, Ali Manzuri. Ali Manzuri is from Kenya. He studied there in the United States, and he came up with a theory called the triple heritage. To him, the black man is a cultural, I don't know, cultural mosaic, or is like kind of a cultural Métis. The word Métis, I don't know, um, for you, for, for, for the best English word, like the way they use the word mulatto to say is a mix, is a mixture of black and white, which is a very outdated term. But that's how he said black culture should be viewed. He said, because Africans are inheritors of Christianity, they are inheritors of Islam, and they also have their own tradition mixed with Western liberalism. So in a sense that if we want to evaluate black people, we have to evaluate them based on the three platforms because they are natural inheritors of these cultures. So there is no such a thing as African culture. It has to be defined within Greco-Roman, uh, I mean, within, within the Judo-Christianity, within Islam, within tradition, because for him, we have over the years contributed intellectually to the growth of this religion. We are contributed intellectually to the growth of this culture. So we cannot be separated now from this culture. So we have to go along with them. This was his own theory. Now, the last one which we is attributed to Diop is the Afrocentric African centeredness. Diop called for uh, African centeredness. For him, if there's anything uh, that will define an African, any philosophy, any subject, anything at all, it has to come from the African himself. He cannot be defined by this negative because he said emotion is not something unique to black people and rationality is not unique to white people. There was a moment where black people led science and led in 
other important discipline of the world, what you would call universal civilization. They were the champions of it. So at that moment, where they the rational one and the Greek were the emotional one. So he said, for that, Negro too cannot go. With the triple heritage, he said, just because we were colonized and we were enslaved and we inherited this tradition. So do we now say, because France, for example, was conquered by German, so French must forever remain German? French people must forever speak German because they were conquered by Germans? The, 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 the situation of we coming into Christianity, Islam, and Western liberalism was an accident of history, was not a natural evolution of our culture. So therefore, we must go to what he called historical consciousness and go back into our history. And going back into our history, we have to rebirth a culture that will be essential to our survival, a culture that will define us in the first of the of, of, of the of the new world order, a culture that will define our humanity, define our sovereignty, define our new role in the new world order. Because be other philosophy, we become what he he, he call um, proxy. Think taught by proxy. We do not have an originator. We have a taught by proxy. For example, Islam. If there is a change in Saudi Arabia today about certain things in Islam, it will immediately take effect on the African continent because it's a thought by proxy. If the Europeans decide anything on, on their liberal ideas, you will find that it will take effect immediately in Africa, but it will not in China. For example, you see Kamala Harris just went to Ghana and she went there and she said, no, I want you guys to implement this uh, alphabet I don't want to call the name. I want you to implement this alphabet culture, okay? And you cannot stand and say no, because now you are intertwined with these people. You guys are practicing in the same culture. There is no gate to tell them that this is how we define our stuff here. You cannot, even though some African leader are trying to do it, but it's a rhetoric. It's not really into the academic. It's not really, they are not defining their culture as the Arabs do. You can't go to the Arabs and the Saudi Arabia and tell them that I want you to implement the alphabet. No American leader have done that because they understand this is where these people doctrine stand. But for you, they see you as one who is following their culture. They find that whatever happened in Europe or in America has to re be reflected in Africa. So Dio said this so-called quote-unquote cultural prostitution cannot continue for black people. That's why history is important for our rebirth. So the, the issue of Renaissance comes from Dio. But now let me give a concrete definition that he gave. So Dio said, Renaissance in red, I write it here in red, is the rediscovery and expression of African creative genius. The rediscovery, and these words are important because if you don't understand them, that's why many people did not understand what Diop said. They started doing all kinds of renaissance, which we will talk about soon. The rediscovery and expression of African creative genius. The rediscovery, he said, we have to recover our historical memory. Because every people, without, if you don't have, a, if you are not able to reference your history, then you cannot move forward. Because it is your historical memory that gave you what you even call your nationality, your nationalism. It is the historical memory that make a people to have certain kind of sentiment towards each other. So the recovery of our historical memory is very important. And let no Arab come and define that historical memory. Let no Chinese come and define that historical memory. Let no European, because the European does not have the morality and the authority to define that cultural memory. Even if he has the competence, he does still does not have the morality and the authority to do so. Because I can never, even if I have PhD in German history, I will never have the authority and the morality to tell German their right history. It will be sacrilege for them. But, um, so, no, yeah, go ahead. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you got the memo, but Africans didn't, um, didn't come up with anything 
you know, any any kind of success that African people have is because of dark Hamites, you know, dark skinned Caucasian Hamites that migrated in to uh, to Africa via North Africa and gave the Africans language and and primitive tools to work with. So I don't know where you're getting this information from. Right. That's why the recovery of our historical memory becomes important because Dio said when he was in school at that at that time, and then many of African scholars have said the same. The theory then was that the only people who were on the continent were the pygmies, first of all, that the tall African came out from Asia and he came and dislodged the pygmies. That was the first theory they came up with. Then they came up with a theory of when they found on the continent then uh, African with different phenotype and different features, they said, wait, this description of this Bantu that we have, now it does not fit in because we go here, we see different kinds of African with different phenotype. Then they came up with a Hamai theory from the biblical perspective, which is not history, it's a myth. So they use myth to construct our history. That's what we said, they don't have the authority and the morality to do so. Because if we even consider the idea of, of taking their perspective of our history, then we have committed the greatest suicide in history because no people should ever, imagine the ancient Egyptians and are in their classical period allowing the Hyksos to tell them their history. Imagine that. That would have been catastrophe. That would have been the end of their civilization. So why should we do it? It reminds me of a, a, a segment that um, Dr. Malana Karenga uh, was, was having in terms of a, a, a panel discussion. You could, you could probably still find it online where, where he, you know, he's relaying a message from Dr. Malefe Kitty Asante, where, he's, you, where you know, he gave black people the charge to take authority, black man. What are you uh, the authority on? Right. You know, and and this is why we write and we do and we set the kind of criteria that we set in Africology and the like because you have to be an authority on your, you know, uh, on on history and culture. But I'm sorry, continue. Yes. You know, that's why the recovery is important. Like uh, yesterday, I I follow your show on um on Mombali Makasi, where you said. You can find the world Congo pretty much everywhere, most part of Africa, and you started naming them. And I'm like, wait a minute. In the Manding language, in the Bambara language, to the farm, to go to the farm, ask, you can go to, there is a Bambara dictionary called Ankata on the internet, you can check it up. To the farm, where you go farm, you plant the water and everything, it's called Congo, Meta Congola. I'm going to the farm. There have, they have different words for it. There's Sene, there's other, but Congo is one of the words, the old word that the, our elders, the older people use it a lot. They will say, I'm going to the Congo, and I'm going to the farm. So I was like, wait a minute. We've been having this word all along in my language, Congo, and we never even realized that what it even meant. And etymologically, we don't know what it means. We just use it. I'm going to better Congola. That in my language, I'm going to the farm. But if you want to trade the etymology, like every word in my language, I can be able to, piece, to, 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 to divide it into pieces and know where it came from. But this word Congo, we don't, we don't really know what the root is, but it just means farm, okay? So that's how, I don't expect a European to do that. That's the recovery, that's the Renaissance process. You are going back in time, thousands of years and reconstructing our language and connecting us to our history. Why? In order for us to build a better future now, because we are trying to build an autonomy. And for you to have autonomy, you have to have defense. You have to have all you need. You have to have your language. You have to have your everything. We cannot forever remain in the European language. This will be for a while, but it will. if we, we can continue with it, the next generation is definitely going to fight it. So I will continue. In culture, in the expression, the word expression in deal definition is culture. And when you speak of culture, you speak of your language, your art, your 
your axiology, your, your mannerism, your, what you consider good or bad. It's your expression and worldview. So our cultural autonomy is very important. And Renaissance must lead to progress. It's a paradigm of progress as opposed to development, which I'm going to deal with. Renaissance must lead to progress. It's a paradigm. And that paradigm is a paradigm of progress on your own terms, not defined by World Bank and IMF and what you need to do and what America decide what development is. No. The Kushites and the ancient Egyptians were not taking notes as to how they should progress. Sovereignty on all fronts and creativity, which deal emphasize in Renaissance, is the aptitude of creativity, the natural inclination to want to create, and the test for innovation. We must create to survive, and to survive, we must create. Black people, we must know this. If you are, remain a consumer, nature will take you out because nature doesn't like vacuum. So for us to survive, we must create and to create. Creation is a must for our survival. Our ancestors, whether they were in West Africa, whether they were in Benin or in Central Africa, they were, they were in the North, they were creating. At any, whether it was a high level, like you find Kushan Kemet, or it was in a lower level, but they were creating for their survival. They were not waiting. Like today, people here, we have to go give charity to Africa. There's people hungry. The Mali Empire, where they were looking for charity, was Sunjata Keita traveling to Europe looking for charity to fill the people of Mali Empire? I don't think so. When did the pharaohs of Egypt leave to go look for help from Europe? You must create. They live. In fact, the Kush Kemet Empire was in the desert. Just water they had that is flowing from the mother continent is all they had to survive. But they knew to survive, you must create and to create creativity and necessity for survival. That's what Renaissance is. The minute you stop creating, death is the next thing that's knocking on your door. That's what we must know as a collective. We are a collective and when we refuse to, to create, that's our demise. That's our destruction right there. So people must understand the DOPN renaissance, modernity and progress on our own terms. That's what it is. I continue. Now, this is where we it get interesting. Why African renaissance? Somebody may ask, why? Why are you even asking for it? We could do development, right? We could, we could just go in a re-economy, and start to develop, why do we need a renaissance? The logic is because we lost something very important through history that must be recovered in order for us to make progress. Now, what is it that we lost? That's what somebody will ask. What did we lost? At least we are better off, some people will say, we are better off than our ancestors. So what did we lost? And here is the answer. We lost the aptitude of creativity, the ability to create the fundamental material and immaterial condition for our existence. We've lost the ability to create the fundamental material or immaterial condition for our existence in any group of people. Once you lost that material and immaterial condition for your existence, you've gone. And the aptitude of creativity. When we look back in our history and see these monuments and see these kingdoms and empires and how they organize themselves, they didn't go to no Harvard University that today you must have before you, you, you are able to do anything. But it was the act of natural because the creativity is there, is to tap into it. So if you can create the material and immaterial condition for your survival, you have to go back and get renaissance. Because one simple example, not even going to Kemet, Mali Empire in the 12th, at the 12th century when Sunjata took over and he defeated Zuman Urukante, the first thing he did was to call for a national meeting for all the clan, every ethnic group or tribe represented. He said, we must create a constitution. It's called Kurukamfuga. 
the 44 edit of Sujata Keita, he said we must create a constitution of human right for us to build this civilization. He began to give those law. He was not, it was those law did not come from the Quran. Those law did not come from the Bible. Those law did not come, they were written even before Magna Carta, human right. He declared those, the 44 laws of human right to govern Mali Empire. These ancestors, they put down the, they, they were able to fulfill the, the material and immaterial condition for their survival. That we must do. We cannot protest and wait for the white men to let us to live. They call it development, but Renaissance refuses for that. We cannot wait for Zai Hawass to tell us who ancient Egyptians were. We don't care what he says. We must decide what Egypt is. We must decide what our history is, and we must be concrete about it. In concrete in a sense that we must have institution and we must be deliberate and we must be conscious and we must have time factor and target project and implement them because renaissance must be visible and it must be in real time it must be seen in real time and we will see that very shortly how some of it was done before you move on i just want to say for all the people who are just joining us we are here with our good brother uh, Seku uh, Kela, and I know I'm saying it wrong because you said it differently at the, yeah, the beginning. Uh, I do apologize, but I'm gonna need each and every one of you who is listening to the sound of my voice to That is right. Make sure that you hit the like button and make sure that you share this conversation with uh, friends and colleagues. We are here expounding on the notion of African Renaissance and what that means. And I am going to let our good brother continue on with this uh, lecture. Go ahead. Yeah, I have three images on the screen and each of them carried. I'm an African and I deal with images. The first image is, of course, done by our young folks on the internet. They show the map of Africa with a different civilization with images before the white man stepped his foot on the continent, starting from far away south, coming down to the Nile Valley. There was no open space in Africa. There were different levels of civilization different level of sophistication, different level of organization, different level of creativity on the entire landmass of Africa. And by the way, this other map on the left, the first one, it looks like it's upside down because it's not upside down, it's in its right position. Because they, they, the young folks are saying, in the Egyptian orientation, south is on the top and north is below. The European orientation said north is on the top South is below a political reason. That tell you history itself, education itself, epistemology itself is political. You must know that. Don't be naive and think that science is science, education is education, everything. No, there is a political element and cultural element to it. There's a reason the Egyptians had this orientation. And they were even more scientifically correct because the Nile cannot flow upward, it's flowing downward from the top to down. So if they were north on the top, it means that the Nile were flowing upward, which is the European destroy our education in the first place. We will need to re-educate ourselves. So looking at this map, it shows African intelligence, Africans' sophistication, Africans' ability to create their own material and immaterial condition for survival. The second map, is the modern, if you type Africa map today on the internet, some of the map that will come up, is a map of Africa showing all the gold, the diamond, the oil, as they are located on different continents. And that's an insult, by the way. For Europeans or for modern African leadership, the wealth of Africa 
is defined by these mineral resources. But in reality, for the ancestors, the wealth of Africa was defined by the quality of the mind of the people. You don't define the wealth of a nation by the amount of crude oil it has under the ground. It is the amount of quality minds. It's the culture, the amount of skills that the people have. Because guess what? You can have the oil and the gold and the diamond and still be poor. Example, Congo. So it is not the wealth of that, or that is under the ground that defines your riches. It is the quality of your mind. It is the quality of your culture. It is the quality of your education and the skills of your people that defines your wealth. And the leadership of Africa today, when you ask them, what is the wealth of Africa? They will start telling you there's the crude oil, is the day we have diamond, Africa is rich. No, the riches of Africa should have been defined by the quality of our mind. And that's the target our early leadership should have done after, after independence. But they were focused on giving Europeans the gold and the diamond. They were focused on doing, they were tripped, I would say, into what they call development. And development, as I will show you, is, 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 a, is, a, is, a, is a scam. Is this in, inexhaustible black hole called development? Developing from where to where? Developing towards what? Developing what? Because development show a linear timeline from point A to point B. Who, who, where is point A and where is point B? Who are we developing towards? What, how is the development defined? They don't know. They are just developing. We are developing. Africa is trying to develop. We want Chinese to build our roads. Africa is trying to develop. My friends, anything that is created by nature naturally develops. It, for it to develop and not to develop will depend on its environment. It will depend on all the resources around it and how it's utilized. If a grain falls on a rock and there is no water, there is no sand, there is no necessary condition, it will not grow. But when the grain falls on a fertile ground, it will naturally grow whether you do something to it or not. But when something refuses to grow, it means that there is something impeding the growth. So the lack of development in Africa is actually under development. It is something preventing the development. That's what they should have captured. Now you see on the last image on the ground, here is a kind of a caricature. You see African Ghana president, Nigerian president, celebrating 60 billion paper money given by the Chinese and why the Chinese man is going with the entire continent. It's just a message that the wealth is not this paper money. The wealth is the quality of the mind of your people and their skills. That's what Europe has no resources. Europe has nothing underground beside Ukraine and Russia. What does France produce for them to control the entire West Africa? What does German produce what do all these people produce? They import almost everything. The real wealth is the mind of the people and their skills. And that's what Renaissance tried to suggest. And I submit to you here, these two images, if you know them, there are people who try to do Renaissance in Africa. After Diop has given them all the definition, they decide to go their own way. On my left here, I know most of you may not know the black man there that is being dressed. His name is General Bokasa. He was the one of the early president of Central Africa. On the right image there is Napoleon when he was coronated. General Bokasa became president in Central Africa in the 1950s or 60s or so, in the 60s. And he decided that he wants to do a renaissance in his country. Guess what? He said he is the new Napoleon. He is the new Napoleon of Africa. He invited the whole world. He invited Europeans for him to be dressed like Napoleon. You can see the costume. He put on the crown. He put on the same dress. He said he is doing a renaissance in Africa. And get what the renaissance is. He is the Napoleon of Central Africa. The European laughed, according to some reports. Some of them ate at the dinner and they went in the washroom and they were laughing and said, what is wrong with these Negroes? You are Napoleon? What are you saying? But I'm sorry for the brother because 
what he's doing is exactly what 75 percent of africans are doing worldwide without seeing it for his own is visible because he's wearing the same costume as napoleon and he's trying to do a napoleon renaissance but this is what we are doing when we you, you know what's even um crazier yeah. is that you know you you wouldn't you wouldn't really know this until you do like a linguistic analysis but the very reason why you see in this um, picture in the center uh, uh of him holding the stick and him having a garment with the spots is because of you know african concepts of kingship going into europe and wow. you know um you know, and the reason why we had this, like when you see the kings wearing the leopard skin, the cheetah skins and and the particular staff is because there was a word for staff. There was a word for king and there was a word for leopard that all were pronounced the same in the ancestral language. So using the concept of paronymy, those 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 uh, concepts were were linked and became uh, visual motifs you know, for the for the uh, sign and emblem of kingship. So here we have an instance of something that is natively African that was brought into Europe, but now brought back. But he isn't adopting it from the sense of being grounded in his own tradition and recognizing what is actually is. You know, he thinking he, he's only adopting it because for him it holds prestige coming from the the european mind and in yes. practice but i'm sorry go ahead yeah that's a very interesting uh thing you said right there because that's the purpose of renaissance because if we don't do renaissance then we don't even realize that these are our stuff that have been turned around half baked and been given to us so renaissance will have saved this brother but now he's trying to be napoleon Unfortunately, how he ended is a sad story. He was overthrown, and most of his gold and diamond was in France, and he couldn't access them, the Napoleon indeed. Now, the image on the right, if most of you are familiar with the Basilica de Notre Dame, the second biggest cathedral in the world is in Ivory Coast. It was built by the first president of Ivory Coast, who felt at the moment that his country was prospering here, he was trying to do a renaissance to bring Rome or Roman Catholic uh, history into Cote d'Ivoire. And he took the entire country money and built this monument, which was visited by Pope John Paul II. And after building there, the whole nation went bankrupt. And since that time, they, tried, they have not recovered. Millions of dollars. He couldn't build universities. He couldn't build research teams. He couldn't even do anything about his own history. He decided to build the second largest. And guess where he built it? In a town where about 60% of those people were practicing African spirituality. They didn't even know what the building was about. He wanted to impress his European guests. So this idea of Renaissance that trying to catch up with European or trying to look European as much as possible is not what the of Renaissance is. That's what I wanted to just point out. Oh, now this slice is blurry. I don't know what happened. It's like I didn't get it right, but the book reference here is written. This book is written by Jose Donacimento. Uh, it's called La Renaissance Africaine, called Alternative au Développement. So this brother, he's one of the good brother out there. If you've never read his stuff, but they are mostly in French. And uh, his, his name is Jose Donacimento. He, does, he writes in French. Sometimes he writes in Spanish and Italian as well. So he wrote Renaissance, African Renaissance, as an alternative to development. This slide is not good, so I will take it out so that I'll be able to explain myself. Oh, I'll go back a little bit. So what he was trying to say in that book is that the term development was created by European after World War II. After World War II, European decided that they would divide the world into three categories. One, they called the First War. The First War 
at America and all of the European nations who have capitalists, they practice capitalism, they have good infrastructure and they have democracy, they are the first war. The second war is the Soviet Union and all its allies and all those other people that were trying to come up in Asia, China and all of it, they are the second war. Then the third world countries, they are the countries which were colonized by Europeans, mostly in Africa and South America, who have not really obtained to any level of development. So the theory here was proposed that there is only one way to progress and it's development. And in order for the third world to become the first world, they need to learn from the first world. They need to go to the first world school. They need to be taught and tutored by the first world. They need to learn the first world language and mannerism and culture and behavior in order for them to pass into the first world. Other than that, they will be stuck into their primitive life. That's the, the origin of the concept of development. The World Bank, the IMF, all the institutions were now put in place to help the third world, quote unquote, to evolve and then develop and come onto the level of the so-called first world. But in reality, it's a trick because there is no first war, there is no second war, there is no third war. It's relative, it's someone who is defining them. Every nation has the potential to develop and make progress. But the so-called first war are preventing industrialization and economic prosperity in the country they call third war in order for their own development to proceed, because in order for them to continue to be what they are, they have to oppress certain number of countries. So for example, the World Bank and the IMF, their duty is to make sure that Africa does not industrialize, that Africa continue to export natural resources to Europeans so that European industries continue to produce finishing products and reshape them back to Africa. So that Nigeria produces crude oil, but no Nigerian does not have refined crude. Nigeria has crude oil under its soil, but the gas and petroleum put in their car, it comes from Europe. They do not have the refinery to process them. They've just started doing that, and it's yet to be seen. So that Ivory Coast has the cocoa and the coffee, but there is no chocolate. The chocolate has to come from Europe. So if any attempt for you to stop that capitalist system, you consider the enemy of the system. This is the so-called first world, second world, and third world theory. So development, therefore, is an evolutionary concept that we and the third world have to develop gradually and get to the level of the white man. So the white man now made the development to be a bottomless black hole that cannot be filled. So African find out since 1960 to this point, they are still not developed. What, what is going on? We keep having presidents, we keep building roads. We are not developed, what's going on? Because it's an illusion. You have to define what your progress has to be. You think Japan followed that pattern to develop? Japan in the 19th century has to close its border away and reject Christianity, reject everything except industrial techniques from European. And they eventually opened up their border. At that time, they were sophisticated enough to prevent Europeans from overriding them. This is, was the Renaissance. This is the Chinese did their own under Mao. So we are sitting down and say, we want to develop. And get what the development is. We call the Chinese to build our roads. Where are our engineers? We, we, want, we want electricity. We have to call a French company to come and then the builders, what well, we are developing. That's not development. Our ancestors produced the material and immaterial condition for their own survival. That's what we must do. Until we are able to create that mindset, the aptitude of creativity, we cannot make progress. So the progress that is sold to us in the name of development is not working. And one good example I will give you as an evidence is the, is the, is the West African currency issue that is ongoing. If you can Google it, you read about it. So in 1970, West African nation decided they're going to have one currency. That was long before EU produced even the, uh, the, the euro. There was no euro. So the African country said, we should have one currency. We are almost the same people. 
we were into one empire before the European uh, colonization. So let's have one currency and open border. So that's why you have the ECOWAS passport that we use. But when it came to the currency, the French government said, no, you can't do that because most Francophone or French-speaking country of West Africa are using a, a currency called SAFA. SAFA was introduced by uh, General de Gaulle, the French president de Gaulle. He introduced that after colonialism in a way to control the economy of West African state, the French-speaking one. So the currency central bank itself is in Paris, and all the assets that those countries have have to be kept in Paris. So Paris decide the exchange rate for that currency. So they are pretty much, it's their money, but the West Africans are using it. So when our West African countries that are not speaking French, like Nigeria, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Ghana, said, okay, you guys need to stop this. Let's come together and have one currency. French president immediately visited West Africa and visited each country. By the time he left, Ivory Coast and other countries said, no, they can't do that. They have to stick with the French money. Ladies and gentlemen, that tells you there is no such thing as development is an illusion. There is a strategy to underdevelop you. So Renaissance would have been an option for Africans to have come out of this mess. And that's why when they created the ECOWAS, Diop had an interview at that time in 1970. He said, this so-called West African economic community or West African state and the, the currency is putting a cat before a horse. They are not going to go anywhere. Diop predicted that like uh, decades ago. He said they can't go anywhere. You can sit down the European control your monetary policy. Then you say we are developing. Right now, as I speak to you, there is a meeting going on in France. It's called the, how the 21st century, how to deal with finance of third world countries. And the president of Kenya, who is now one of the outspoken leaders on the continent, was telling the French president, we can no longer continue with these deals. These international transactions are against Africans. In fact, for an African in Nigeria to make a call to Ghana, is more expensive than he making a call to USA. You imagine that? Everything was arranged to rig the people on the continent. So he said, we need to change all the rules of commerce and businesses. And I'm asking myself, why do you travel to Paris to ask the French president what you need to do? Why? Because you guys have not understood the concept of Renaissance. You should have been autonomy. Economic autonomy, economic sovereignty, military sovereignty. But you cannot do that if you don't have the right mindset, if you don't have the right intellectuals in the school developing the minds of the youth that will take that decision. Because Renaissance cannot happen without a mass movement. Because it is a youth, the youth who will rise up and overthrow the neo-colonial system and replace them with the Renaissance leadership. And that cannot be done if the information is not in the universities, if the information is not in the colleges, that's why the most attack philosophy on the continent today is Afrocentric. Everybody loves every philosophy, but once you say you're Afrocentric, the Arabs are after you, the Europeans are after you, the Africans are after you, because they say you are a threat to Islam, you are a threat to European cooperation, you are a threat to Christianity, you are a threat to everything their current system is existing on. Did you um, see the slide that I had um, put up some time? Uh, was it in the, well, it wasn't that one. Let me, let me uh, see something real quick. Okay. Uh, just, just to, just to solidify the, the point that you made. Uh, let me, because I want, I want to, I want to say it exactly how he said it. As uh, as not to to misquote anyone. Um, 
Where's the one I just had for Cleveland? Happy, happy. Here we go. Um, so th th this this just goes to to um, prove, and I'm a present share my screen. Right. So remember that we had the um, we we're supposed to have the Hopi conference right. in uh, in Egypt, right? Yeah, and I so have a slide for, for this. <laughs> yeah. uh, so you know, so not to go through the whole thing, but you know, uh, they found out that Dr. Obinga, uh, Anthony Browder, myself, brother uh, Infudishi, and Jabari, and Dr. Solange Ashby and more were coming. So they got in their feelings and, and got the event canceled uh, in the same way that they did Kevin Hart recently. And so from that one website, uh, this was one of the news um, programs that was, you know, uh, having negative things to say about us. And on the YouTube channel, uh, one of the comments reads us, follows you know of course written originally in Arabic but uh translated here I would like to report the to the attorney general so that we can be assured of the effectiveness of the conference because this organization represents a threat to Egyptian identity in North Africa as a whole right talking about the uh the the African centered scholars and even you know Wesley Muhammad when he was on the Breakfast Club in 2017 they were talking about there was a segment in the on the conversation when he was talking about uh you know education and and getting into debt and things and so Angela Yee on the on the program states that some kids say today that they don't need college because there are people that are successful that never pursued a higher degree Wesley Muhammad says, and that's true. Everybody doesn't need a college, uh, doesn't need college. And the fact of the matter is most of us in college are pursuing BS degrees. BS is in bullshit degrees because we're pursuing fields that aren't practical. DJ Envy will talk about it. What are some of those degrees that some of them are pushing towards that you feel are BS? Uh, Wesley Muhammad says, well, uh, folks will get mad at me. DJ Envy says, let them. And then West Muhammad comes back and says, you know, but for years, uh, 80,000 for an African history degree, that's not practical. We can get African history. We can get knowledge of self without incurring the debt. Right. DJ Envy says some stuff that was undecipherable. And then West Muhammad comes back without incurring the debt that college education imposes on us. And when we get that degree, it has very little practicality. That's not nation build. That's not a nation building skill. But a lot of us are running to get an African history degree. And I would and I'm not disrespecting those who are experts who have their degrees in Africana studies. But I would not as a conscious uh, as but I would not as conscious as I think that I am and as pro black as I am, I would not recommend or even allow my children to pursue an African studies or black studies degree in college. But it goes a little deeper than this. Because previously in 2011, he he says this at a Savior's Day. And keep in mind that Dr. West Muhammad, of course, is Muslim and more specifically within the framework of the Nation of Islam. So he's telling other members of the Nation of Islam, our children are being kidnapped by ideologies other than Islam. Gangs, Afrocentricity, or the so-called culture of hip hop. We're losing our children to all of those other ideologies. So the notion that, you know, what you're saying here about uh, once Afrocentricity gets mentioned, then, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a wrap, you know. Everybody uh, is fine <laughs> until you mention Afrocentricity because it's a, a kind of an epistemological rupture. It's a divorce from the old, lie they found the very foundation of our struggle it it kicked it up so 
there are black people who are torch bearers, who are who have been there as pillars holding this system. So when you to discard it, they feel empty. Because that's why Pan-Africanism, people don't ask why Pan-Africanism did not succeed that much on the continent. After all, the, some of the most outspoken leadership on the continent, like Kwame Nkrumah, were Pan-Africanists. Because they failed to see that aspect of culture. They overlooked it. They overlooked the aspect of culture and felt that the political movement is enough. We get all people together. They were bringing the North Africans who were not original to the Pan-African idea. The Pan-African idea, which uh, 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 that was formed and eventually we inherited that uh, Kwame Nkrumah brought down, was not, it was about the, the protection of black people, black people emancipation. Because first of all, that's why history is important. What was the struggle? slavery colonialism and why our black skin our identity our culture is under attack our history is under attack our very humanity was under attack so we needed a solidarity movement global movement to protect ourselves and also it should become an agency for our prosperity of our protection now you get the continental on the continent then you include all the arabs and now they think it are eluted and then it dies almost die because if culture was involved from the very beginning they would have focused all their energy on south of the sahara maybe they would have made our deal wrote an economic basis for uh, the cultural and economic basis for a federated state deal doesn't directly say he don't want the arabs because hmm. that make me make him to look racist but technically that's what he's saying remember if the title really of the text is black africa yeah, then the, the subtitles. People don't understand. He was a very technical guy. He was very sound. He's I think he did philosophy. He knew he come from Senegal, and ninety percent, ninety nine percent of Senegalese are Muslims, and he understand that he wants to get this message to these people, but if he start going religious, then they're going to shut it down. So what he does is he act like he's saying it, but you you have to struggle to find it in his word. You see, that's why when he talk about the return to ancestral religion of Osiris, is one of his articles. And people say he's Muslim, what have you. No Muslim will preach evolution. He, he discarded Adam and Eve. No Muslim will tell you that Islam, fundamental ideology of Islam is coming from Kemet. No Muslim will say that. So Diop was already discarding this religion. But the Afrocentric idea is very threatening to these people. Why? Because, my friends, history is a political subject. And no people will acknowledge the history of the, of the other and validate it. It's not going to happen. Russia will never validate the history of the West. If their survivor depends on negating everything from the West. The Western world and their media, their survivor depends on negating Russia and China. Everything coming out of there must be put in the cloth of propaganda. This is the way the world goes. We are the only people who think people should say the right thing to us. No, it's normal. If the Arabs didn't even attack us, then I would be surprised. Because everybody in history wants to be associated with power. They, if you go by 19th century, Arabs want to have nothing to do with Pharaoh. Nothing at all. In fact, there are pictures of them selling mummies, okay, vandalizing graves and selling it out. They didn't care about it. In fact, the way they name all these places, how they call the Heru Market, they call it Abu Hor, the father of whatever. They gave names to these places to tell you that they are not from there. Everything was looking strange to them. Then now they've come in the 21st century. They've seen this. They've understood the Western war, how their renaissance happened. Then they see black people moving toward the, They see that this is going to be dangerous. If these people are able to appropriate this power, even our existence here on Egyptian soil in many centuries to come, is on a threat. We might be flushed out of here in the, in, the, in the distant future. So they start to fight it. So we must understand them fighting it that way. That's how it should be. But we must be resilient and we must understand where we are going. A lot of black people will not accept African Renaissance. They will not accept it. Now culture, you see, when it comes to culture, we tell people 
when Diop speak about culture, he said, it is the psychological factor of our identity, the linguistic and the, and, 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 and the historical factor of our identity. And you must understand that culture is, I include our language, our ideology, our values, our ito, how we even view things around us has to be our culture. That's why when we look at Egypt or when we go back into our history, we want to do Renaissance, we are looking into all our classical history. And when we see Egypt, we see our culture. So we count it as one of our intellectual property. It's not, a, it's not something, why didn't we go to China or there we go to Arab world and claim? No, it's because we see behavior, we see ideology, we see values, we see motifs that are representative of our culture already in, the, in our continent. So we are appropriating it as our intellectual property because it belongs to us. And culture is very important to the Renaissance because black people, whenever people use the word black people, black people all the time, I think it's white people putting all of us in a box. And sometimes we don't belong in that box. Why? Because there are black people who will oppose what you will call black culture. There are black people who will oppose what you will call black consciousness. So I think when Diop used the word culture, culture becomes the important identifier so that we know when you are in this culture, you are with us. If you are out of this culture, then you are black, but you don't belong to our culture. That's why ancient Egyptians were not admitting all black people into Kemet. For them, it was their culture. So it doesn't matter if you came with black skin, if you don't identify with that culture, they can kick you out. They can put a throw stick on your name and say, foreigner. That's how they operated. You see, it was not just race. Now they put her into this group and say, anyone we see black men identify with her. Well, when the first African conference happened in Ghana, most black people who came there were CIA agents. They came to Kwame Nkrumah conference and they were interpreting, but they, they were actually working for the enemy camp. So we should not all think that because a person today has a black skin, he automatically belongs to our Renaissance struggle. That also is, we should point that out, it's a cultural thing. We identify our culture and we define the borders of it. We have a, um, a, a saying uh, here uh, amongst Blacks in, in the United States, um, just because they are uh, our skin folk doesn't mean that they are our kin folk. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So when it comes to the issue of history, which we're just talking on, People don't realize that in 1964, when Africa was coming out of colonialism, there was a need to establish African history. There was a need, a growing need to understand what is the history of this continent outside what the European has said, because there was already experts who called themselves Africanists. And Africanists were actually Europeans, expert on African history. So they became expert on a culture whose language they don't understand, whose spirituality they don't understand, who they have prejudice against. So they wrote all manner of stuff, Hamai theory, uh, Afro-Asiatic, Pygmy, uh, Negro, or all type of stuff were written because they, first of all, don't understand it. So UNESCO, a branch of the United Nations that deal with science, culture, and history, they said, let us bring all African scholars and some European experts together and have a concrete understanding of African history so that the world will begin officially identify African people with that history. Because my friends, believe it or not, there are literatures out there. If you read the work of Victor Hugo, you read the work of Hegel, you read the work of Gobineau. You read the work of Les Benis. These people said that we were not humans, that the continent of Africa is a European legitimate property because we have not come into the light of reason. So the UNESCO wanted this myth to be discarded once and for all. So they called for this scientific movement to write the history. Now, many African scholars came together. They were divided into three. There were the first group called the European Africanist, which I already explained. Then there were the African historian from a Eurocentric perspective. 
we must also identify those African historians, but coming from the Eurocentric perspective, why? They have a Bible to protect, they have a Quran to protect, so they are not objective. Those groups were there. Then you have, I think, four groups. Then you have the African historians or African centered historians. Then you have the Arabs. So this history we are written, when it came to the chapter of Egypt, they invited Diop. That's when Diop said, look, I'm not going to write anything about Egypt until we have a debate. Because if I write it, you guys are going to put it as a myth. You are going to criticize it and then dump it and say Diop concocted it. So bring all the best people in the world. We're going to have debate in Cairo. If they win the debate, we can, we can then we can approach ancient Egypt from the Levantine perspective or the Middle East. But if the debates prove otherwise, then it must be counted among the legacy of Black Africa. So at that time, the African origin of humanity was already acknowledged. And Diop went onto the platform. I will not go into that. We already know they won the debate. But after that debate, Europeans changed their tune on ancient Egypt. They no longer say European were white Caucasian or black Caucasians. They removed that. They no longer say European were white people who marched out of Europe. Some of them were saying that at that time. They stopped saying that. They now run behind the irrational Arabs. And because the Arabs were claiming that no, we have certain phenotype as black people, even though we are white, then so it was us. So without any proof. So now Europeans who are all not, always dishonest, they now rally around the Arabs, then they start saying, No, we cannot put race on ancient Egypt anymore. You know, we can't put race. It, it happened. They put, there could have been African, there could have been. So uh, there's a mythical race in Egypt that we cannot define them. That's the position they are holding. But UNESCO was clear that the evidence of Diop and Obenga was overwhelming. So Diop makes an important comment. He said the negation of history and the intellectual accomplishment of Black Africans was a cultural murder, which preceded and paved the way for the genocide here and there in the world. In other words, when people successfully distort your history, they are literally killing you because they will justify any crime they want to do to you because in their mind, because well, there's one thing about human being, we have some natural morality, it's called conscience. So in order for us to perpetuate evil, we need to convince our conscience that we are doing the right thing. So in order for them to convince themselves to keep the racism, to keep the killing of black people, enslavement, or subjugation, or looking at black people as subhuman, they have to keep the history that you created nothing. That's why modern Egypt is fighting what they are fighting. It's a political war, not a scientific or historical one. So Dio continued. He said, those the imperialism, like the prehistoric hunter, first killed the being spiritually, culturally, before trying to eliminate it physically. So they will remove you out of history, denigrate your culture, then now the next thing is for them to eliminate you. That's why our history must be dear to us. That's why Renaissance, the first foundation of it is history. And history must be reclaimed. The culture must be reclaimed, the best of it. And the future must be paved by any means necessary. Now, after UNESCO conference, they have no argument for these Arabs to even attack our brothers. Look at this next slide the One African Conference, which uh, Asar Imhotel just showed you. When UNESCO called for the general history of Africa, wasn't it a One Africa Conference? It was a One Africa Conference. And nobody said that it's only Egyptians have to go there. No, all of them were invited. But the truth were put into their right place. So these people calling for One Africa Conference should be a welcoming idea. If these people were sophisticated enough, they could have said, we want to take part in this discussion and see what are some of your discussion line, what are some of your proofs, and we also have to bring something to the table. We want to participate in this discussion. Okay? UNESCO should have even made a statement on this because they conducted a, 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 an entire debate on the subject. Even though, yeah, they said the panelists say they are rejecting deal debate, 
but it was not rejected entirely because they could not refute the argument technically. So if you cannot refute my argument technically, you don't postpone the debate, you just lose. You see, you just lose. It's like you're going to play football and then now the match, the referee blow and we start playing. Then I start running with speed, start scoring. Then you say, well, I was tying my boot. I wasn't ready to tie my boot yet, so let's postpone the match. It's not done. You lost the match. You lost the game. So they lost the game. That's why they can never call for any scientific debate with Africans. They will only be insulting you. And they are used to the caricatures images. They use those images. They go pick out some Africans who might not look good to them and begin to post them and say, oh, look at your face here. Look how you guys look like monkeys. In fact, one of them, he told me that you guys can never be the builder of ancient Egypt. I said, why? He said, because you are a gorilla. I said, you are absolutely right. That's what I told him. I said, you are absolutely right. I am a gorilla. That's why in ancient Egypt, the god of knowledge, Jehuti, was represented as a baboon. Because you, you hate baboon. Because you have, you guys hate animal. You have your nature. You don't have no association with it. That's why you could have never built Egypt. Yes, I couldn't have built Egypt, because, but that's why I made the baboon the symbol of learning, the symbol of, of, of knowledge. I said, you understand that now? Then he escaped from the chat. He didn't talk anymore. These people are not intelligent and we must not give them the chance because black people, I read some, a lot of comment, even when the Cleopatra thing came out, a lot of the intimidated, oh, we shouldn't, some Nigerians make a video, oh, we shouldn't claim people history. What do you call people history? What have you read? You guys are quick to protect. You are quick to validate Europeans' comments and the Arabs with all their intimidation and the flag, flag passing. Them. All those things don't count. Come on the scientific debate. That's what Dio said. If you want to challenge me, let's get on the blackboard. That's where we do it. At. All those rhetorics don't work. You see? So they canceled this, but they could not cancel the UNESCO General History of Africa because they were also there. They were contributors. So the idea of Egypt being Africa and one Africa is an established fact. So Egypt should withdraw from African Union. Because if Africa is going to do a collective Africa renaissance, Egypt must be in it. So if they are saying that they are not African, they are not one Africa, then they should withdraw from African Union and stop playing African Cup of Nations and stop identifying with these privileges. You see, so it's pure hypocrisy. It's just a little group. And I will tell you about the agitation in Egypt, which many of you don't know. I've been to North Africa. It's just a little minority group that are westernized, that are pushing this agenda because they got some Western education and they have certain agenda in the tourism industry or they try to do beauty pageant, they try to present because they are lacking connection to the Middle Eastern Arab who don't consider them. That's the thing going on you don't understand. The Middle Eastern Arabs are calling them your cousins. You are black. You people, your, 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 some of your great ancestors down world are black people. You are not really Saudi Arabs. They go through that. So now, out of anger, they are now saying, okay, now ancient Egypt is great and then it's being praised around the world and the Europeans love it. They come, let's cultivate it and make it our own. This is how now they want to identify with it. But the real majority of the people in Egypt are Islamists. And anytime the Islamists take, they do a revolution and take over power in Egypt, you will never see these messages. In fact, they will, they, they will even start to destroy some of those museums. It's going to happen in your lifetime and record my world because I know the Arabs. The day the Muslim Brotherhood takes power in Egypt, some of those museums will be closed down because. The Arabs, Muslim, authentic one, they continue to write that Pharaoh is black, that this, all these things are kafiri, all these uh, idol worship are black people stuff. That's why the authentic Arab in Egypt, that's what they are saying. They don't even doubt it. They tell them these are black people stuff. They are devilish stuff. Pharaoh is cursed. But they, these, uh, these elite Arabs, 
that have become Europeanized, that are now trying to identify themselves with Greco-Romans, which they want to claim because whiteness is a privilege. Whiteness gives you privilege. It makes you go around the world. It makes you get jobs. It makes you acceptable in America. So they are trying to cultivate the white supremacy, global white supremacy, which is kind of profitable. It's what they are tapping into. It's an agenda, but it has no root in Egypt because the day Islamic party takes over, you will see something else. So that is just, that's just that's something that I want to tell you guys and you should keep your mind on it. It's a temporary agitation that as soon as they are overthrown, the new group that come up will be putting Islamic uh, things up and they will be destroyed. One example is Syria. When the Syrian Islamic revolutionary were entering, guess what they did? All the Persians, the Persians uh, uh, buildings, they burned them down. They destroyed the museums. Only the Islamic architecture was allowed to stand. It happened in Mali. When the Islamic took over Timbuktu, they burned down some of the remaining things there. They wanted the only thing that is Islamic to stand. So don't be surprised one day that the Museum of Cairo will be closed down by Islamic Brotherhood Party when they take over. So that's I just wanted to say that. They are not standing on anything. Now I want to read this important quote from Dio. He said, today again, of all the people of the world, the black man is the only one capable of demonstrating exhaustively the identity of the essence of his culture with that of the pharaohs of Egypt, such to an extent that the two cultures can serve as reciprocal references system. The black African is the only one who can still unmistakably recognize himself in the Egyptian cultural universe. He feels at home. He is not up disoriented like any other man who is Indo-European or Semitic. As much as a Westerner today, reading a text of Kato feels the echoes of the soul of his ancestors. The psychology and the culture revealed by the Egyptian text similarly identify with the black personality. Diop. What is the evidence? The evidence of what Diop said well, one simple evidence which is carved in stone is the Kushite Renaissance. 744 BC, the group of men coming from the south of Egypt, in Africa, because they use this term, and my brother uh, Imhotep destroyed that myth, Nubian, Nubian, and we don't find it anywhere. So we, we don't want to use it. A group of, 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 of what you will call African today from the inner part of the continent, south of Egypt, marched on Egypt when Egypt was under, I think, the Libyan rule, and the civilization declined. Because this is where we are going to know whether this is black people civilization or not. Because in the Arabs' mind, they were slaves and primitive. So let us say a group of primitive, quote unquote, coming from inner Africa and took over Egypt. What they were supposed to do? I think they were supposed to be passing around, dancing naked. But no, we didn't see that. We see a writing from the Shabaka stone that was restored. It said His Majesty King Shabaka wrote this document anew in the house of his father, Pata. Why is his father, Pata? And His Majesty having discovered it as the work of the ancestors being warm eating. It was not legible from the beginning to end. Then he wrote this document anew, more beautiful than the one that was before it. In other words, he restored it. In order that his name might endure and the monument last in the house of his father, Pata, for all eternity, being a work of the son of Ra Shabaka, for his father, Pata, in order that the might might be given life internally. So this African gets into Egypt. He restores documents, sacred documents. And he said they are documents of his ancestors. Wait, where is the Arab? Where is the Levantine people? And why should Shabaka call this his ancestral work? That means why he was still in Kush, they knew that Egypt was their ancestral property. This is written 
744 BC, then I should come and listen to Zai Hawass. Like, for crying out loud. I should be out of my mind to do that. Which is authentic? What a pharaoh who sat on the throne in Egypt or a non-entity, let me not use some words, you know, or a guy who is overfell with Islamic racism and Arab hatred against black people. Because Islam is one of the white supremacy religion in the world, but people don't realize that I've been a former Muslim, I will get into that one day. So the Kushai dynasty put an end to this debate because we saw the Hyksos taking over. We saw the Libyan taking over. They don't say they're restoring the work of their ancestors. Maybe if there's a document like that, I would like to see it. So here is the legitimacy of black people to this legacy. And what is important today is the Renaissance aspect that these men restore a civilization that was dying. They went back in time and restored and rebuilt. This is what we must do. We must go back into our historical memory. We must go back into Mali. We must go back into Songhai. We must go back into Kush. We must go back into Mwene Montapa. We must go back into Great Zimbabwe. We must go back into Kemet and pick the best, rebuild our power. Because one thing people have to know, how you look at people is a perception that is built over time through media, through history, through books. They prepare your mind to see beauty. They prepare your mind to see what is nice and what is not nice. The perception of black people today was molded over the century. The caricatures, the drawings, the bushmen, the all kinds of things they've said. But when they see the Kushai standing in their glory, then they are shocked. These are the images that must be reproduced. These are the images that must stand in our universities. Not Socrates, not the images of, 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 of Aristotle. These are the men that should be standing in all areas of learning of black people because the images of excellence and power for our kids. That's what Renaissance is. When they say, Zahi Hawass, in one of his interviews, he said, they were black, but they were not Negro. Okay, I speak Italian, okay? Negro means black. So when somebody said they were black, but they were not Negro, how do they, what is the, what is this term for that in English? Is it oxymoron? Or what, how, when someone say two negative things at the same time? I don't know what the English word is for it. It is like saying it is white, but it's not white. Is it phenotype black you want? I mean, hotel the third gives you. Is it not their nose like that, their lips like this? Here is the grandfather of Tutankhamun. His nose is like that, and his lips is like this. The grandmother of Tutankhamun, Queen T, her nose is like that, and her lips. And what is she doing with my grandmother's braid? Queen T, what are you doing with my grandmother's braid on your head? Why are the Arabs? I didn't see any statue from Saudi Arabia like this. King Amenhotep, why do you look so African? Why don't you look like Zai Hawass? I don't understand. Why do they have our hairstyle? I don't understand either. And I look at, and I posted this image one time, and the Arabs were very angry with me. I told the Arabs, I said, whenever I see the yellow people being bound in Egypt, it reminds me of your recent president. Your Lutu president, when you look at them, they look exactly like these Hicksos that we have bound. So this, if the Egyptian would have been alive, that's how they would have seen you guys. You have nothing to do with this. Look at Tutankhamun's real face from the Lotus and look at the reconstruction done. They want to kill you by destroying your history because history is image, it's powerful. Image is very powerful. Look, man, the human brain is the greatest machine created by nature or by God. If you train it to do anything, it might, it will do it. So by we putting, it's like computer. Do you put garbage in 
garbage out. When we feed our children with great images of black people, of African people, they will produce nothing else but greatness. So what the European do? He produced another Tutankhamun that your children might not like too much, that might not look like your kid. He trying to literally put a bullet in your head. That's what we should not allow. Our universities should have these images all over Africa, but the Renaissance did not happen. So the African continued to tie himself into his tribal history and the mythology. Yeah, the tribal histories are good, but go beyond that. Go beyond that. Because even your Nigeria that you have is not a monolith. There's a lot of different kingdoms there. But you put the kingdoms aside and say you are Nigerian. So now put your Nigerian aside too and be African. And by being African, you reclaim the greatest of our civilizations. That's how we come back onto the world stage. And I tell people, when we go back to reclaim these images, we should reclaim them without fear. I posted this image. The image on my left is the image, is the word, is an hieroglyph, by the way. It's the word for face. I think her, H-R. Look at the Khoisan brother and look at that face. I'm calling the Arabs. I said, I give you $1,000. Produce any indigenous Arab that look like the word for face in ancient Egypt. $1,000. I produce the Khoisan. You give me one. You see, they cannot give you. These sisters, what is the Egyptian doing with our neck, our colors? Africans all over, we have this neck color. It is very, it's part of our beauty. It's part of the way our women present themselves. So the Egyptian came from the Levantine to come and wear our clothes. Okay, then we don't want the Egyptian. We need our culture, that's all. You see? All of these brothers and sisters, our leopard skin, our neck color, our priest, how they dress, our hairstyle, it is ours. So I'm ending in a few more slides. Here is something very important. The two people you see on the screen were both presidents of Nigeria. The man on the left is from the north what you will call lower Nigeria. The men on the right is from the south, what you will call upper Nigeria. Now look at their phenotype. And this is not just because two of them, it is the ethnic group they come from. The man on the left is from the Fulani ethnic group, the Fulani Hausa ethnic group of Northern Nigeria. They have a phenotype that you will call Hamai, so-called. That you will that you will call Black Caucasian, you will call Egyptian, whatever. What the 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 Northern Nigerian, Fulani does not look like the Nigerian from the South. These are two presidents in our lifetime. If these were Egyptians on the wall, the man on the left is called Olusegun Obasanjo. He was president from 1999 until uh, 2009 or so. Also, he he would have been called Nubian. The man on the left would have been called Egyptian. But these are two West Africans from two from the same country, Nigeria. It's just the ethnic group. This one has the phenotype that Zai Hawa will pass for Egyptian. This one has the phenotype that will be considered Nubian. But that's how we are in Africa. The North and the South, in many parts of African countries, there's phenotypical difference. That's how Egypt was. I gave you another one. The man on the right is a Fulani from Guinea. And 75% to 80% of Fulani in Guinea from the Futa Jalo area, especially Labe, they look exactly like this with a pointed nose and with this skin color. The man on the left from the Madingo ethnic group, his name is Dumuya. He's the current head of state. And the Fulani man on the right, he was the former prime minister. Two of them from the same Guinea, one from the south, one from the north. The man on my right, 
the Fulani guy will have passed for Egyptian in Zai Hawa's criteria. Then the man on my left will have been called a Nubian or he would have been called Southern Egyptian. You cannot play the phenotype game with African gene diversity. So brothers and sisters, claim your ancestral history and don't look back. The future is calling and the renaissance is necessary for our survival. Development is a scam and we must do a total renaissance to, to take a giant leap into the future. That's what the renaissance is. You see, I would have loved to give these two photos to Zai Hawass. I said, Zai Hawa, this is a Fulani man. His name is Selun Dalin Diallo, Prime Minister of Guinea, President of Guinea. And their people look exactly like this. I'm a Madingo. I look exactly like the brother on the left, and the, the, the Dumuya guy with, with the, in the army. He's the current head of state. I'm a Madingo from Liberia. He's a Madingo from Guinea. We are very dark. Most of our people are tall. I am not tall. But most of our ancestors are very tall people like Senegalese. The Fulani are very skinny. They are very, very, you will never find a Fulani guy with muscles like us or with athletic body. They look very slim and tall and they, they will look exactly like the Tutsi that you find in, in, in Rwanda. They are in West Africa. They are our brothers and we are there. We marry with them, they are married with us. Our skin tone is different, no problem. So who is the Negro among the two of them? So that's the problem, that when these people play these games, you don't listen to them because come to the continent. We will take you around, we take you to Labe, and we take you to Kanka in Guinea. You will think you are in two different places. When you get to Labe, you find all people like the men on the right. You get to Kanka Sigidi, you find all people like this guy. Then what? You see? So you can play the phenotype game. So now our Renaissance scientific progress. Science is very important to Renaissance because deals stress creativity. But the issue we are having with science, because in the development uh, paradigm, those who are using the paradigm of development, they also stress science. So what's the difference? For us, the difference is the science in those with a development paradigm, the sign is not used for African progress. This brother, for example, his name is Sheikh Modibo Diara. He's a scientist for NASA for a very long time. But when he returned to Mali, he became politician. By the way, if you check his profile, he's one of those who were commissioned to do the mission to Mars. And he did fantastic job. He's one of the most recognized astrophysicians in NASA at the time. But guess what? The brother later on, he started working for Amazon or what? He used an entire talent to develop NASA and came home to become a politician. There was no scientific institution built, nothing built. What does that say? It says then that becoming scientist is not enough. But does the scientist, does the science serve the interest of black people or African people? That's the question we must begin with in Renaissance. So African scientists must serve African interests like it was in the ancient time. If Imhotep was a great scientist for Greeks and he developed Greeks and Rome, he would have been useless for Egypt. It doesn't matter that he was black. So the idea of we having black scientists is not a question. Does the science serve the interest, the agenda of black people? Because there is no lack of scientists among black people. I can tell you that. There are many black scientists and nuclear physicists around the world, but does their research and their work serve the power of our, uh, 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 of our survival? That's the question. Science and creativity must be domiciled in Africa. The government and the private institution must invest in research more than any other nation. Black people must invest in science, I think, more than any other people. Because as Diop said, science is even our culture. So a scientist must be a sign in our community. Even we, as we are calling ourselves, a conscious community. There is a need for us to respect scientists in our community. I don't see that a lot. 
when I see people like Brother Imhotep come on stage, he do a lot of rigorous research. And some people just go and enter YouTube and say, it's pseudo. Oh, it is pseudo. There's a lack of respect for our scientists in our community. We must, even when we disagree with their opinion, we should give them, we should make them to feel respected and we must give them incentives, support their work because only progress can only be made through science and they have to be tried and error. Making error is not pseudo. Trying something and two years later updating your information is not what pseudo is. You'll stop misusing this word. And we must be promoting... When Brother Asa Imhotep was on the Francophone show, the brother is, I think his, his native language is Chiluba. But when he listened to your research, he said, I must tell you, you have done a powerful research. Even myself, being a Congolese, I am astonished. I am amazed of how you came up with this. Term. And they are all, I'm hearing them. I recognize them. But back in the community, you guys think he's joking. You guys played it down. You guys call it oh, a pseudo and it is that. How do we make progress? You have not even done the primary research that he has done to debunk the work. You just come up and say the pseudo. Why? Because I don't like his face. You know? That's not how it's done. And I hear people, he said, camera does not mean black. I said, calm down. We have to honestly listen to the person's argument. If you are really scientists or you want to be renaissance or you want to progress, you listen to the logic of the person's argument. Like me, I said on this Kemet issue, I said the argument given by uh, uh, my brother Cambon, it makes sense that, you know, there are wars in Egypt, they use the word Kemet, they will put a cattle in front of it, then they use Kemet, then they put a cattle, which means black cattle. They have used it as an adjective in many other places, fine. But I said, I saw an argument which I support in a way. Why will Egyptians saw a need to call themselves black in the, when they were already black? Because the use of the word black was in opposition to our whiteness. And because whites have dominated or they call us black, because in opposition, when they met us, it's just like when we saw them, we gave them name. Like Nigeria, the name for a white man is Oyibo. Oibo means the one whose skin skin has been peeled off, because to the eyes of the ancestors in Yoruba land at the time, these people's skin must have been removed. So they have the real skin, and these guys probably by some mysterious or climate, it seems that their skin got peeled off. They started calling them Oibo. So if white people have adopted that word, they will be calling themselves Oibo. He whose skin has been peeled off. I don't think they could have built their identity around that. So we. Uh, I wanna. I wanna. Um, I, I hate to interrupt you, but I just wanna play something real quick. It's a, it's a short snippet of Naomi Campbell on a recent interview. Uh, who? Not Naomi Campbell. Uh, Iman, uh, the model. She was on a recent interview on uh, Sway in the Morning. So I'm, I'm going to share my screen. And uh, here we go. And, and just listen to what she says, to just the back of what you said. And so I come from a different mentality, uh, uh, being a, uh, you know, uh, you know, if, from po politics and majoring in political science, everything I did it through that filter, mm -hmm. the politics of beauty, the mm -hmm. politics of race and beauty, right? But at the same time, I came from a place that I, I was never treated like how they treated black African-American mm -hmm. models. Mm -hmm. And I came from a place also that I have never ever described myself before I came to the United States as a black person, mm -hmm. I come from a black country. Yeah. Uh -oh. So there was no reason for us to call ourselves black. You know, we, we were like Somalis and we were, we are fierce people. Yes. This is the only African, black African country that has one language and one religion. Mm. We may I'll just pause it there. But you, you heard what she said? I hear what she said. And 
is absolutely correct because it was in opposition to a people calling you what they see. It's like the, 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 the war Ethiopians or all this type of word, the people trying to just describe something in their head, okay? So Sudan. now, yeah. So these people in their homeland, they have other names. We've seen Tamiri, we have seen Tamiri, all the names we associated to a concept or to, to, a, to a, a kind of a higher ideology or it was referring to the environment. So now at this point, there should be a serious political reason until you convince me otherwise why they should have come down to call themselves black. Now, does that mean we cannot decide today to even use the word Kemet for black or use other black? I argue that if we have a political reason to do it, we can define our philosophy and say this is why we want to use it. But we should not insist and say that it must be that because we are already clinged to it. So it, it's not because we look at men, even in West Africa, how people define themselves. They just call themselves sons of men. In Madingo, the word for our people is manding. Ma for the word mogo, from human, ding, mean children, sons of men, children of, of, of human beings. That's all. They added nothing. They didn't add color. They didn't add anything. They just said they were sons of humans. Even the language, Unko, is I speak. That's the name of the language. I speak, Unko. But we now call Madingo. He's speaking Madingo. But in reality, it just say I speak. You see? So this is the way they, they, I believe that we must be careful uh, in trying to pull down our scientists when they quick, are doing quick. research. When Quick they are going, question. yes. The on on the word man, um, for example, when you say mandinke, mm -hmm. is the K because uh, I'm I'm looking at, uh, well, I'm looking at a Bambara dictionary, uh, and I think they have a K meaning um, like inhabitant of or uh, yes, like is is that the grammar? Yeah, so uh, okay. K and K have different meaning also. It, it depends how you are going to use it. So if I can use K and K to mean inhabitants or someone from this place. So if I say, for example, Sonin K, it means the people who have come from Sune. Hmm. So we have to find where Sune is. But it simply means the people of Sune or people who have come from Sune, so you know the K a designate area. Hmm. So I will say, so if I say Malinke, then now now it, it, it would now mean then the people from Mandin. But when I say Mandin Unko, Unko, then it will be different because the Unko there with me I say. So they depend how you use it. Then also hmm. there's another tricky way they use the word Ma. So Ma means human, but sometimes Ma it also means uh, humanity or acting right. So if I do something nice for my mother, he will say that I have done maya or madenya. I have done something that is humanly. So it's righteous, it's good. So it's maya, it's human. No tea. Okay? It's, yeah. you are, I have done maya. I did something that is human. So yeah. when they became Muslim, they changed it to Adama Ding, sons of Adam. So when I mm -hmm. do something good to them, they will say, hey, Ibarra Adama Denyake, you have done a thing, and the son of Adam should have done. But in the religious theology, Adam should have been associated with the wrongdoing. But mm -hmm. they are now using it that if you are Adama Ding, that means you should be right, you should be upright. You should be doing things that are right. That's what makes you human. So being human is tied to doing something right, being upright. You see? Mm -hmm. so, so that if sounds some, uh, yeah. a lot like my art. Yes. So doing something right is maya, is, is doing human. Or the Bambara will say mogo. They will, put, they will, they will pronounce it out mogoya. Ibarra mogoya. The Bambara will say mogo, mogoya. So the, 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 the Guinea Malinke will say uh, maya. 
So everybody will just it keep changing. The sound keep changing, but it just mean human humanity, right things, doing goodness. Okay, and I tell people, I am not a linguist, and I know nothing in the ancient Egyptian language. But when I people read it, I pick words. When they say jati, what is the jati? Is it the governor? <laughs> okay, I don't. Know. In Madingo, a jati is someone, a a a a a, 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 some, a person who receives you, a, like a guest, and you are a guest. Your host, your host is your jati. So. This is the way we use it. Maybe ancient Egyptian have different meaning, but the words sound similar. But for us, it just means host is the jati. So that's the way we, there's so many words, so many what I found. I will take my time, maybe if I take time and get some words down and be able to see how I can compare. But I'm not a linguist, so I don't want to do any kind of mistakes thinking I'm comparing languages where because they sound alike. So that's what I'm avoiding. That's why I never do any major show on that. So what I'm trying to stress here is that we must value our scientists. When Dio was coming up with this word, there are people who say he was stupid and crazy and this. Now we find out that he was right. Even if he made mistake or something, but the, 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 the concrete idea or his entire thesis cannot be discarded. The technicality aspect, we can find mistakes in Dio. He has made mistakes in some technical aspect. But when it comes, when it comes to uh, the, the thesis itself, he was right. Diop never said, um, like some people always say, that he said Egyptian left the Nile Valley and they came to become Wolof. That's not what he argued. He's arguing that there was one mother culture or language, perhaps, that this other culture or language branched off from. So it's not like we are saying when I'm speaking Madingo, then I'm speaking the Medu natural language. No, there could have been the mother language that everybody branched off from. Because even the Madingo language itself, I can I speak three different types of Madingo, and sometimes we don't understand each other. The Gambian Madingo, you see, the, the Madingo of Guinea, of Mali and Liberia, they might sit in the same room and they will never understand each other. It's the same Madingo language. It branched off just during the colonial period, not just too long. When people just moved around, run to their villages, escaping slavery, escaping uh, Islam, escaping different things. The language branched off and created different dialect immediately. You see? So imagine thousands of years. Imagine 10,000 years. Imagine 3,000 years. So... That's why when our scientists are trying to reconstruct this thing, we should follow them carefully, support them, read their work, because the Renaissance will not happen if we don't have the scientists to put in the work, to go back, to make our time travel into our historical memory and bring and rebirth our actual paradigm. And once we get on our, our actual paradigm, there's what will happen is called irreversible progress. An irreversible progress is not controlled by your enemy. Your enemy is not the one to dictate what your progress is. When you get a group of black people who know what they are doing and they are on the right paradigm of African Renaissance, they are unstoppable. It's natural. They will just make it. You see? So that's what we must do. Renaissance is science. And Diop demonstrated this. Even while he was in Europe, and he realized that his, his, his vision was African Renaissance. He came back home and built a radiocarbon lab. People didn't know that Dio went as, as far as the Sahara to date the Sahara Desert. He wasn't just passing around writing books. He went and dated the Sahara. He said if it was the desertification is less than 7,000. So Africans were already in, the, in those areas. So you call them sub-Sahara. So what was happening when they were in that place before that 7,000 BC? And that 7,000 BC, the Nile Valley is already populated. So he was doing the work and he was doing the science. That's why his final words, which they put here, because in front of the University of Sheikh Antadil, they've now put a monument for him. And in, in front of the monument, there is this thing that's open like a book 
where some of his strong words were written there in stone. It's written in French. It says, Formez-vous, armez-vous de science jusqu'au dam. He said, Educate yourself, arm yourself with science to the teeth. Et arrachez votre patrimoine culturel. And you guys have to uh, uh, forcefully take your way, take your cultural memory, take your cultural legacy, take it. It's not going to be given to you in a meeting. There will be no time. Europeans and Arab will come together and say, you know what, black people, we gave up. Egypt is yours. Kush is yours. You guys can do Renaissance. It's not going to happen. Start demonstrating in front of Zai Hawass. With the, do powerful conference. If he does a conference in USA, the next thing you should do, there should be an international Nile Valley conference. And it should be on a new discourse. We should have a team of scientists every year that update information. We have no time to be waiting, to be demonstrating in front of one Arab, even giving power to his name. You know, in ancient Africa spirituality, you don't call the name of your enemy. Or you don't call the name of an enemy who died or alive. You don't even want to mention their name. It's, it's like giving power to their spirit. You see, my grandmother, if she's having, she's having beef with her neighbor, she will just find a, a description. She will not, because by calling your name, I even gave you spirit. I gave you power. I gave you energy. I gave you in the in the in the in the liberal term, they say I gave you publicity. You see? So we need to do the job. Diab was not going around demonstrating, you know, you know, for, I'm not saying it's, it's, it's a bad thing, but I'm saying Dia wouldn't have ever done that. He would have been lost in his laboratory, he would have been in the desert in the Sahara, digging up bones and, and doing radio carbon. By now, he would have been a DNA expert. Okay, because they are playing with our DNA. The, the entire African genome has not been mapped. So the little 3% they have, they are using it to define who black people's genes are. He will have destroyed that theory right from the start and, and then suggest a new research by African universities. It's not to be, what these people are doing is what they are supposed to do. You just saw Seth and Heru doing the Smitaiwi. It is set job to put, to, to, to occupy the space if Heru fails. It's what Seth is going to do. He's going to take it. That's why Ma'ad was important in ancient Egypt because his fat takes over. Nature does not like vacuum. You slip, they take over. That's why Seth is standing face to face with Heru and say, you mess up, I take over. And Heru is like, I'm looking straight in your eye. I'm not taking chances. That's how the world works. That's how economic works. That's how politics works. We are the only people who think that there will be an international conference. The black people, behold, you are free. It's a joke. It's not happening. We have to take it. And Diop demonstrated that with his life. And this is the end of the slide. Hotel. So, therefore, African Renaissance, the rebirth, the rediscovery of African creativity and genius the rediscovery and expression of African creativity and genius in your literature, in your art, in your music, in your science, it must all be for the rebirth of Africa, the rebirth of the African race. Why the rebirth? So we can make a giant leap into the future and control our own destiny. It's a paradigm of progress. When it succeeds, black people anywhere in the world should be on top of the pyramid of your environment and not the bottom. That's the goal. Indeed. And, and before we go, I just want to um, share, because many people know that when it comes to, uh, when it comes to, you know, re redefining uh, African wisdom traditions, you know, I've adopted the term out of the uh, Congo, out of Key Congo, uh, called Kimoyo. And uh, which is a term that I got from uh, the late Dr. Fukiao, Kimbwandende uh, Kiabun Seki Fukiao, to be exact. And 
he mentions the, the term in his PhD dissertation. And but, you know, uh, I'm privy to having some some text of his that was published, excuse me, some text of his that he has written since the early 60s and 70s, but it hasn't been published yet. And, you know, there's a there's a book that he wrote called uh, Vuelvo Mesu, which means open eyes. It's, it's, a, it's a book on initiation from the from the Congo standpoint. And on page 33, you know, um, when it talks about, you know, initiation being led by an Nganga, uh, he, he says the, the, the statement, no one can grow strong, wise and powerful without being fed by the past. And this is one of the reasons why when I uh, designed the, uh, the, the, the logo for or, or the the hieroglyph, I should say, uh, yes. for for Kimoyo, that it is basically the infinity sign, you know, uh, the old school Ouroboros, of course, which you find in uh, ancient Kemet, in in many different uh, types of designs, like you see uh, on on the left hand side here, and um, but but this statement alone kind of really echoes much of what you you said in this conversation uh this evening and you know i just wanted to say that i uh appreciate you know what you're doing the perspective that you bring you know to the larger conversation and some of the solutions that you that you provide that you know kind of helps to shift the conversation in in this so-called conscious community space, uh, you know, from some of the conversations that we've been hearing, you know, over the past few years in terms of uh, the quality of the conversation. And there's more conversations like this uh, that we need. And I want to open the time for any kind of questions and answers. And I know there's going to be a a, a brief time lap uh, between what we say and what they hear uh, yeah. live. So if you have a question or, or a comment or something um, for our guests, uh, Brother Seku, to uh, put it in the chat and I will make sure that I put uh, I will put it up for him to um, respond. And while y'all are thinking of your questions, um, I will simply uh, do a brief commercial break. back 
and I put the link and just in case you want to uh, ask uh, uh, the question directly. And um, it looks like we have uh, someone, so I'm going to add them to the conversation. So we have, uh, looks like a Dr. Daniel LaRoche, if I'm saying that correctly. Uh, welcome to yes. the Mbongi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you well. Oh, okay, I'm in Rome, and it's ah. about 11 p.m. over here, so I'm not camera ready, so please forgive me. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> uh, but uh, congratulations. Uh, that was an excellent presentation, Sekou. Uh, appreciate the work that you're both doing. In that respect, my question is this. Uh, you were mentioning something that we should have an annual conference of... Um, you know, the African origin of civilization or something to that effect. And I wanted you to talk about that a little bit more, what you had in mind and also a potential location for that. Because, um, you know, as you know, the Happy Conference got canceled in Egypt. And so Egypt may be too hostile for such a place. But uh, with some, you know, Sudan has a lot of political violence right now. But maybe would Ethiopia be a good place? Ghana be a good place? So, just uh, your thoughts about the type of conference which you would envision and the location. Right. So, um, the annual conference I was referencing, because this is a continual thing that we will do through our life, we'll continue to unearth new information, continue to educate the public especially when we now have a strong opposition you know, to our own history and our own culture. So what we needed to be, the, 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 the generation of Diop and of Bengal, what they have left, and then the, all the, the um, you know, Dr. Ben and all these people. Now, instead of individual, we can have individual independent research, but there should have been an umbrella organization in my view which incorporate the DOPNs on the continent or the, those in the diaspora through for different school of thought and different organization but an umbrella whether you will call it NGO or you will call it a research but I will have research group archaeologists forensics different type of people that we finance we contribute to these people that we give them in resources that they continue to update our information that every year there should be an international conference. It has to be, we are global people. It can be in Dakar this year, next year is in is in New York. The other year is going to be happening in South America. The other year it can happen in Sudan. That they begin to bring out more information and this information begin to be uh, kept in volumes and we begin to disseminate them to university. Whenever there's a major argument, for example, a major institution come out and say, we have DNA and the ancient Egyptian were not black and put it on international media like that. It demand not protest, not going to do the, not, no. It demand that a robust response and a stand for our people who are also getting this type of information on the internet, where there will be an international conference that we will come out with alternative view and say, this is what it is to counter it and then put it out there in our archives so that our children don't Google and just go find uh, wrong information. Because anything you Google is what the white supremacy decide to let out. So what happened? Now they have started censoring. Censoring. You do that, they stop you. You put this on, they, they stop this organization. If the next organization is any next generation is not equipped and there is no organization standing to push this information forward, then they begin to decline. They begin to be afraid of censorship. Then that's how, again, we go back to the trenches. So for me, I'm saying there is a need for all these organizations. Anthony Browder is doing a great work, but he's not in a research team. He is doing it alone. He's not working with any linguist that I know of. He's not working with any other people to come together and maybe put this information together. Look. The Kemetic or African Renaissance community is very big. It's even a market that worth hundreds of thousands of dollars, but we, it's, it's like we are not using it. It's like if we are just fragmented here and there. The Francophone community is very big. They are there. 
pushing this information, but we are disconnected. There is no market, there's nowhere we can trade around ourselves or organize a research team and have an annual research and get, give report, even to a point of having a university for that. You see, so for me, that's why, and we are waiting for an individual to do it. And I'm, I'm, I'm worried why we are not doing anything as a collective. Okay, good point. Um, I put my um, email uh, in the chat behind the scenes there, so if you could reach out to me, I'd like to follow up with you on that one-on-one. -on -one. Um, have you guys ever been to Turin in Italy? Sorry? Have you ever been to Turin in Italy? To where? Turin. T -U -R -I -N. No, to, uh, you mean Torino? Torino, yes. No, I've not been to Torino. I was in Sicily, Sicily and Catania. Yeah, so I was just there, and they have the second largest Egyptian museum uh, with a lot of uh, comedic artifacts, mm -hmm. uh, Old Kingdom, Middle Kingdom, a lot of New Kingdom stuff. And so, um, and then, uh, so I was there about two days ago to visit that. I took a lot of pictures and posted a lot of that information to share with the community. Uh, and then also, uh, the at the Vatican, they have the tech in there, which is from ancient Egypt. I'm going to check that out tomorrow and try to learn a little bit more about that, that they have this uh, Egyptian monument that's there. Because I'm in town for a conference. We have a World Glaucoma Conference where we're presenting a paper in here. So that's what brings me here. But I'm checking out the uh, comedic history that's located in this area as well. So... Um, okay, thank you for the excellent presentation. Uh, Seiko, uh, please email me. I'd like to follow up with you on a couple of these topics and uh, setting up some sort of a conference. I have some, some couple of thoughts and ideas I want to run by you privately. Okay. And thank you, Asar Emote, for an excellent show. I appreciate you for coming on. Now your email now. Thank you so much. All righty. All righty. And... Um, before we move to uh, Brother Dex, um, we have a quick question from um, Obeya, Obeya Man. Um, are the history graduates of black colleges making progress? I guess on the on the um, on the issues that you brought up, you know, uh, earlier. So I don't know what you know when they say progress. I don't remember in terms of making money or what 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 is what is the understanding of progress is what i i don't know if you can follow clarify the question what does he under, what does he mean by progress all right if you are still there uh obey man is it whether they are advancing in the field making more research or in terms of their employment employability whether they get jobs is that what you ask exactly all righty um we have dex with us welcome to the Mbongi. What's going on, brothers? Can y'all hear me? We can hear you well. Okay. Uh, I thank y'all for putting this together. I um, first heard a Seku on uh, Brother Shakura Speaks channel. We were speaking on the Malcolm X. Uh, he did a presentation about Malcolm X like a couple months ago. But my questions are, do you feel we should um, put choose some type of language uh and if so do we would that advance the renaissance or push the renaissance forward and do we go to a ancient language or do we use a modern language in order to progress the renaissance that's my first question right Thank you very much, bro. I think that's an excellent question because our, the Renaissance cannot be done without a language, really. That's the fact. Because the language is the vehicle of culture. It's what transports the culture. It's what brings the knowledge forward. So for me, if the political, because for you to adopt a language, sometimes it demands political will of those in power or leadership to say, okay, this is what all nations in the world, a national language is adopted through a political action. But this, as it stands right now, African countries are kind of stuck in the neo-colonial paradigm of development 
that they are waiting until maybe the end of the world for them to develop, I don't know. <laughs> but if at all a revolutionary leadership comes up by any chance, there, there, is, a, there is a growing interest in Kiswahili. And the growing interest in Kiswahili is because the language is spoken by so many countries in the East, in East Africa already. In fact, a big country like Kenya was already adopting In fact, for a Kenyan president to address all Kenyan in native language, it has to be in Kiswahili because they have other languages there and they are divided into different groups. So he can't speak all those languages. So they, they pick Kiswahili. So for me, Kiswahili remains a preference for me as a continental language. There could still be regional languages because you can have a, a language or continental language for commerce and scientific research. And then there could be also regional language, West Africa, East Africa, Central, can all decide to adopt regional language and there should be one national language. It's important even for the connection of our diaspora family. My brother Asai Motel was on the sh a show yesterday, you know, presenting his scientific research. They, he has to speak English and the lady have to translate into French. So then they will have to speak it to the other people. This has been happening since 1800. <laughs> when we meet with our people to talk in the European language, there has to be middle men. And that's going to kind of, it kind of delays creativity. It, it delays the connection. It delayed the program that should have been made faster. So for me, Kiswahili should be adopted, but it should be adopted and be enriched. I'm not a linguist, but I believe many people have done it. If I speak English today, I hear a lot of Latin words in English, especially if you're a legal practitioner. Yeah. You hear most of the vocabulary used by legal practitioner are not really English words, you see? So they use Latin words to fill up the gap. If you go to medical field, you have a lot of Latin and Greek words in them. So what we can do, we can enrich Kiswahili with the ancient Egyptian language. Mm. This can be done. You put a team together, you take word like tape accept, accurate conclusion using correct method of analysis, which is for me the best word for science. You take it instead of the Arabic that is in Kiswahili, we can drain it out and refill it with uh, 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 our, with the Medu nature language. As we keep enriching it with vocabulary, legal terminologies, spiritual terms, and uh, out medical terms, that's how the language is a, it's a living thing. It's keep feeding it, it keep developing. Eventually it becomes a continental language. Brothers coming from the diaspora can just come directly and see me and say, you know, and still start to greet me in Kiswahili. You see, as Santa Sana, we start to talk. We don't have to need a translator from Portuguese to Spanish to be translated between us. So for me, Kiswahili is necessary for science and commerce between us. And we can develop it. It can be done. It can definitely be done. It just demand political will. All right. I, I like that answer. Uh, I was learning Kiswahili on this app. Uh, Duolingo, I suggest all brothers in America or the United States get that app and start learning Kiswahili. Um, my second question is uh, uh, sounds like uh, we are missing a body or an institution that controls or or uh, what do you, what's the word I'm looking for? that the, ma maintains and monitors the progress of the Renaissance. So what made me think about that is uh, ministries, uh, Ministry of Defense, Ministry of Culture, Ministry, like Marcus Garvey had these ministries and we no longer have them as far as in the West and the United States. But my, the, the point of the question is, do you, we, do you feel we need the for one do you feel we need a uh hierarchical structure within this so-called institution that governs or maintains the progress of the renaissance and two uh do you feel we need to involve all of our people from the common man to the 
a diplomatic politician or whatever? Or do you feel it could come from the ground or the grassroots, uh, uh, for better term? Yeah. So, you know, one thing about revolution is the revolution becomes successful at the point where every individual feels that he has a responsibility to make it successful. That's when you see revolution really start to, if every individual in that revolution begin to see himself as an agent that will make this revolution succeed, that's how the revolution begins to succeed. The issue of higher structure is very, very necessary for, for me, the way I look at it, because information needs to be disseminated, needs to be controlled. There's a way it has to also get to the proper places in terms of schools, in terms of textbooks. Now, when you have an organization that will now partner with universities, you get your books in very easily. You become, uh, even without even staging any kind of major political revolution against these African leaders, we can become donors to some of their universities and say, we are donating books and what have you, or we donate to their curriculum. So from there, we put in some chemistry books. The information goes in and we need a central organization to do this. It should be less political. It should be more scientific and research organization so that there will be no this political tussle, who is the leader, who is not the leader, or someone want to build a cult around himself. We don't want that. It should be more of a scientific, uh, decentralized kind of uh, organization right. where you have three, four, five people elected. They lead a scientific research for two years. They step down for another four younger people to head the organization. It has economic branch of it. You have, uh, you have to also have the, the aspect of the research. You have to have different, different kind of uh, a agency or what you call ministry right now. And they should be operating towards the success of this renaissance. And they should be building institutions around that will be pushing this agenda because the renaissance is coming. It definitely is unstoppable, but it's been slowed down and sometimes is being hijacked. For example, in Senegal, what is going on right now? There's a young man called Usman Sonko who is trying to become the president of Senegal. And he read Diop's book, The Economic and Cultural Basis, Black Africa, The Economic and Cultural Basis for a Federated State. And he said, we are sleeping. You know, we need to follow Diop order and really build this country. So he, we have to flush out the French. He started speaking things that Dio was saying years back. So the young people in Sheikh Anta Dio University rallied around him. He became a star in the country. And he's, if, he go to, if he go to election today, he's going to win. But guess what? The government and the French authorities say he's a danger to the state. And they are doing everything possible to prevent him from becoming president. They even put a rape case against him. They went to court, he was not guilty. Now they found him guilty for corrupting the youth, that he's corrupting the youth. And this guy is an economist, he's very sound, and most of his theory is that he quotes Diop. And the French were like, oh, we thought we got rid of Diop. There's another one, okay? He said, we'll get rid of the French CFA. We need to create a national language. What are we doing with French in 1960? What is so special? about these people's languages that we clinch to them. If you tell some African leader we're getting rid of English or French tomorrow, they start shaking. It's like the world is about to end with them. Who told you that these languages come with some jewels and flowers that you can find in your own language? So he's trying to get rid of it. So I'm saying the Renaissance needs to be controlled. Otherwise, then it becomes to a point where it happened in a different way. Some people are changing the world and fit it into the Islamic narrative. Some take it and fit it into Christian narrative. And some are even practicing traditionalism, which I, I, I have did not addressed in the slides. They go to the villages now and said, Diop said we should go back. So now I'm going to grab a live chicken and make a YouTube video and eat and, and then 
and then snorted the live chicken with my teeth. That I heard that that's what my ancestor used to do and spilled the blood on my head. Okay, hold it a minute. Renaissance is not, you want to practice traditional stuff, no problem, but Renaissance is a strategic return. And it is about rediscovery of our creativity and genius. So if you want to do traditionalism, uh, where you want to, you say, my ancestor used to eat in a clay pot, so now I want to eat in a clay pot. My ancestors you don't used to move around with clothes, so now I don't need clothes. My ancestors, you know, they used to live in nature, so now I'm nature boy. I'm going to go in the forest and be living there. I don't want to, okay, that's not what a renaissance is. You want to do it, we have no problem, but that's not what a renaissance is. So right. we have to now control the information, explain it properly, and people will not be misled or kind of dilute the information. So we need to control this information, and we also need to disseminate this information. So an institution is needed, a central institution, not political, mostly academic and scientific institution. It seems like ASCAC was that institution, but... Not anymore. So how, you guys, you Asar and you uh, and Chakra, I feel sh are already somewhat of the foundation of it. And there's a few others. And then we still have some elders. Like we still got Dr. Wayne Nobles and huh? Leonard Jeffries and such. Um, how do you feel about being the foundation of the the institution, being viewed as the foundation or the beginning of it, or the new base of it. Um, hold on, I said, hold I, on. I will take a, I will take a short break, washroom break. I'll be back. All right, no problem. I just sort uh, of want to. Uh, hold on, oh there we go. Um, state that you know um, we're coming to a, a close here so when he comes back i'm just going to have him do a rapid fire uh, with some other questions from the from the chat and um, but in terms of your question that that is actually in the works and and that has been along the the lines of uh some conversations that that have been happening behind the scenes uh to the extent in terms of uh, the politicalness, like even for example, when you look at the University of Kemet Press, um, Dr. Taka Kilimanjaro and, and his team, that, that's kind of what they have envisioned, why they published those books, you know, focused on that, that, that institution building and and alike and they're they're currently developing a university uh an online university so you know that'll be a, a particular place of uh dissemination of information and the like i myself i'm working on a you know an entirely different field uh, educational field uh which we call into com and it the the one of the reasons you know for this well, there's many but uh the idea is to to publish our own journals uh to have the types of conferences that uh was spoken on by um brother seku uh earlier and and to really be able to update these this information without necessarily having to uh fight unnecessary you know issues and the like and so you know that these these conversations have been had and you know we're we're working to create those types of spaces and 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 for me it's not necessarily that we even need just one you know organization uh because you know if 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 one organization doesn't do something right or something to this nature we just have a funny you know, relationship in, in terms of supporting uh, that. So, if we, if, you know, because the Europeans, they have many of these uh, different types of organizations that they're doing that type of work. And so, but, you know, the the kind that uh, 
that was spoken of by Brother uh, Seku, you know, this is one of the reasons why, like, for example, I'm trying to introduce this this concept of using the the uh, Kwanzaa, you know, principles as the days of the week, the the seven days of the week that we had. They're all key Swahili, so this is a this is a way that we can introduce these key Swahili terms in terms of values and and they're marking every single day of the week you know and then you have certain kind of do like what they do in ghana amongst the akan you know where there's like a a certain like even in yoruba tradition there's like there's certain days of the week that are dedicated to certain you know um kind of ideals and things and we can we can do the same thing with uh the he, the Kiswahili terms in terms of the week, days of the week, and this is this is just ways that you know you kind of bring in usher in in the culture, and um, I was saying to him before you uh, or when you left that you know we're kind of coming to a close, so the next questions are going to kind of be rapid fire uh, that's coming from the um, the the chat room, but I want to say first and foremost uh, thank you to Mega Rude Boy. 007 for the uh, donation and contribution to the uh, channel. And I do recognize as well uh, your uh, contribution, uh, Dr. LaRoche. And so I just got the notice of, of that contribution as well. So I want to uh, thank you uh, personally for that. So I want to go back. Someone asks about your um, social media. Uh, Brother Seku, where can they reach you? Where can they see you at? Your your volume, I mean, your mic is not. Uh... Tell myself. There you so go. I said, should I write my Facebook name in the chat? Um, yeah, well, actually, you can do this. Chat, then we can put it yeah, in the, in the private chat, and I'll put it, I'll make it a banner so everyone can see. Okay. All right, and uh, it says, Hi, Seku, I've been following your presentation since you first arrived on Southern and I was impressed from the first day. You're going tremendously and I'm absorbing and adding uh, to your energy, I'll show you. And let's see, Christopher, Dr. Christopher Cager says, science is not our enemy. It's the way science has been used that makes it appear it is our enemy. We were the first scientists. Uh, let's re harness this great energy to our benefit. E. Bynum. And that's Dr. Edward Bruce Bynum, as he says. And uh, X underscore G says, I think the elder Obinga has started in university this year. Um, and learn to dig two pits ask uh, is the repatriation of artifacts achievable brother seku um what artifact is he talking about <laughs> because or oh, you mean all generally all african artifacts uh, i'm assuming so the, yeah, or, i so guess I, i'll restate it for him do you think the the idea of returning the African artifacts is achievable, or at least in our in our lifetime. Well, honestly, I don't know. I don't really know if it's achievable, but I think <clears throat> what is important is those who are asking for those artifacts are not serious. They don't, I don't think they are really serious about it, and that will surprise you because. Most of those artifacts that you see, especially those from, in fact, the entire continent, they were once considered to be idols. They were destroyed by some Christian missionary. People don't know this. Like most of the ego artifacts were actually destroyed. The Europeans took them because some of them were not really that much into the religion. So they were taking them to fill out the museum. But the new African who become convert we are very hostile to their ancestral material. Even as I speak, in some part of Nigeria, there are some pastors who go place to place destroying shrines. Hmm. Okay? They destroy them. So now they are asking for it, 
because uh, it's in the media there, and then now they want to make publicity out of it. They know that museum is kind of a way of making money. They are not really asking for it because they think it's important to their cultural renaissance or because it's something actually that is fundamental to their cultural development. It is just a political way of them just trying to spin this around in the media and say, okay, if you don't give or give us this, they don't really care about them. If they really care, like all the books in Timbuktu, as I speak to you, have not been translated. <laughs> they are there since they were written in the times of Ahmed Baba, they are lying down there. African government have not been able to pay people to translate those books in the library of Timbuktu. So we even know what is in there. It's Europeans who go there and translate some of them. So these artifacts, like the one of Benin, okay? The people of Benin today, virtually all of them go to church. <laughs> so when you even ask them on the street, or internet, Joe survey that do you need those artifacts? Some of them will tell you, ah, those devilish things, I don't, I don't really want them. It is those few that have been westernized and say, okay, yeah, we need them. We want to put them in the museum. Like the Nigerian past president, Muhammad Buhari, who was uh, an Islamic fanatics. Do you think he cares about African artifacts? You know, he doesn't care. What will he do with them? So I'm telling you, they are not serious. If they are really serious, it's a diplomatic discussion. We sit down and say, look, we want all of this, and this is our stand. And Europeans, when you take your stand, they either defeat you or they, 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 they submit. That's the way they operate. They can either defeat you or they, they accept your demand. So Africans are not ready for those artifacts. And when the day they are really ready, I think they will get all of them. The Egyptians that are demanding for them, Remember, they used to sell them. <laughs> Remember, they used to put them in the auction market. And some of them used to even sell mummies. So they need them today because the politics have changed. And I even heard Zai Hawa is selling some of them. <laughs> so why on one hand, he said he won the Rosetta Stone back. But during the revolution, the Egyptian revolution, he was selling Actifa secretly. He's been exposed. Yeah. So... The seriousness is not really there. The day they become very serious, they will get those artifacts back. All right. Well, this is going to be the, the last question of the night. Okay. And it is from Inyame Ubuntu. And he asks the pertinent question, is Pan-Africanism dead? Hmm. Your take. Pan-Africanism is not dead. It's been redefined in the 21st century. You know, through the concept that I just showed you, the, the Kepra is coming into being. We have to continuously come into being. The reason why it didn't work all these years is for us to take lessons to know why was it delayed? What were the impediments? What happened that it didn't take effect immediately? So we find out that there are so many things that were not defined by Africanism. One, there were a group of Pan-Africanists who were akin to socialism and the textbook socialism. There were a group that were not really into the socialism. There was an issue of culture. If we become a continental United States of Africa, why culture is going to dominate Western liberalism, Arabs, what? This is things that were not defined. And if you don't define those, it becomes impossible. When Gaddafi was going around as a born-again Pan-African, you know, people don't know Gaddafi is a born-again Pan-African. He actually was Pan-Arabist. That didn't work. Then he turned around and became a born-again Pan-African. But what was his Pan-African idea? It was just prosperity. He wanted to build roads and to train. But he, his country, Libya, will be the capital of Africa. So it's a kind of Arab control of Africa that what he wanted. So Pan-Africanism has to be redefined in the 21st century. It's not dead. And the redefinition, is it has to have a cultural basis for it. The Black people of the South part of the Sahara, we need to come with a cultural unity. With the cultural unity, Pan-Africanism become more effective 
and we can have a theory of economic, a theory of, 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 of governance, and we can bring out a lot of theories because we can't just have a political unity, then what? There's economic theory, there's culture, there's a lot of theory. If you don't do that, the same people who stayed the revolution will come back and kill you because they don't even know what to do next. You see, even if Kwame Nkrumah has succeeded in uniting that continent, I could tell you it could be a, a ground of civil war right now going on. There could have been Arab breaking away. There could have been some group breaking away. As Nigeria, as we speak, that is the biggest federation on the continent. They are fighting tribal war. The eastern part of Nigeria, the Igbo, they want to break away because they believe the north is trying to impose Sharia and dominate them with Islamic uh, law. So the issue of culture has not been settled. There is no Nigerian culture. There is Igbo culture, there's Yoruba culture, there's Hausa culture. So Nigeria only exists for the elite. It does not really exist in terms of the culture, in terms of national language. If you take away English tomorrow, all of them can talk to each other. So that's not a country. So, so we have to redefine Pan-Africanism. That's why its sister philosophy, Afrocentricity, explains Pan-Africanism. That's why people don't understand. Because Afrocentricity is what put Pan-Africanism into its proper perspective. You see, but that's why history was important. You want to build a Pan-African state without any reference to history? Who are these people you are bringing together and why? Okay, why are you bringing them together? So that's where your history needs to be answered. What are their values and what happened? And you see, the north of Africa, anytime their life is threatening, the only way they know how to find revolution is to, is to evoke Islamic revolution. That's the way they fight oppression. We in the south of the Sahara, whenever our life is under threat and we want to fight, we evoke traditions. That's why you see many African passing around that they are Christians, they are this, they are that. But whenever there is a civil war, you see all of them putting on their traditional clothes, going to the villages, preparing themselves to fight. They make reference to their culture. So that's why it's important for to develop a national culture. When we develop a national culture that is rich enough that we all can make a reference to in terms of science, in terms of development, in terms of education, economic, then that culture becomes something we all feel. That's why ancient Kemet become very important for deal because it is, it, it is free from the tribal baggages that the other ones have. Because if we revive the Benin civilization, for example, in its entirety, then the Yoruba will say, I'm not a Benin. And the Hausa will say, no, I can't be Benin. But when we use Kemet, which it go far back, then everybody becomes, can make a reference to it. Because not because it's old, but also it contains some elements that everyone can identify with. So that becomes a principle of Renaissance. That's why Dio said, Kemet is to Africa what Greek and Rome is to Europe. I just want to, while while you're while you're on that point, and, and you invoked Shekanti uh, Joe in one of his interviews, he he stated the following. He said that we must reconstruct a new Afro American cultural personality within the framework of our respective nations. Our history from the beginning of mankind rediscovered and relived as such will be the foundation of this new personality. Now, he's not talking about, you know, an Afro, like the, the ethnic group African-American. He, he's talking about the African-Americans because he was visiting the United States here in 1985 when he made this statement. So he was saying that we need to create a new African culture rooted in 
the framework of our respective nations. You know, uh, our history from the beginning of mankind, rediscovered and relived as such, will be the foundation of this new personality. So he's saying that we we to to address the issues because remember that he was for United States of Africa. And, you know, we, we evoked the book earlier, uh, Black Africa, an economic and cultural basis for a federated state. The reason why Shekanti Joe was uniting all of the data regarding the commonality between African languages and the such is to, to fight against the the localized tribalism yes that was was on the continent that was preventing them just like it's preventing them today preventing yes. them then as as it is preventing uh them today from creating a united states of africa so what he was what he was saying like to to answer the question you know under what culture we would create the new culture but it would be grounded in you know the 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 best of our traditions those those common features and characteristics that unite us historically anyway you know we just need to put a new frame on it so it's just like um and you'll be seeing me do more lectures in in the near future when i'm talking about hip-hop music because hip-hop music and culture actually provide you with the the methods and means to achieving this because for those of us who are producers and djs all we do is remix you take the best you find the soul of a track and then you create a new ensemble based upon that that historical track for which you are sampling and you create a new vibe for the day. And that is essentially what um, Sheikh Antijop is, is saying in this quote. I'll let you have the final word. Yes, that's, that's, that's indeed an excellent. That's what we are, we are driving at. We, we are looking at, like me now, I, I tell people, since I have come to the knowledge of African Renaissance, I have become detribalized. In the, in the African sense, I've become a born again African where I no longer see like Africans as Igbo, this and that. No, I have now a higher understanding of what we should be as a collective. That my tribal uh, background and what of you is important, but it has little to do in terms of geopolitics, in terms of global economic power, in terms of we facing the adversary that face us as African people. My tribal identity is so insignificant in getting me that protection. So I need to have an identity, national identity. And that national identity is African. And that African must not be defined by United Nations or IMF or World Bank. It must be defined by us. And it must be defined in terms of history, in terms of culture, in terms of philosophy, and once it's defined, it must be elevated in terms of economics, in terms of science, in terms of whatever, it must be protected so that it becomes a powerful tool for our own survival. That's what we are trying to tell people. So the Igbo and the Yoruba ness and what have you is, is, it has to change. It has to, we are not going to continue that way. So when people are saying, oh, I'm foundational Black American, yes, we accept it. But then does that prevent you from uniting with your history, with your culture, with your global identity, which is your Africanity? If that prevents you, then you lost. You just lost the battle. And you don't understand <laughs> what, we are, what we are up to. Oh, I'm Igbo. That's all I know. Well, then you've just lost the battle. You don't understand where we are going. You see, very soon your Igbo name will be insignificant because when... The, the Chinese or the whatever march on the continent, they are not looking for Igbo. They are not looking for Madingo. <laughs> they are looking for the land and the African land and to take it. That's why we have to come together. That's why we have to be a unified. Our survival depends on it. 
So Diop was right. There has to be a new African personality, a new Afro-American personality. And this personality must be rooted in African historical past, in African cultural memory. And he must be an excellent being that wherever he found himself, he must be on the top of the food chain. That's what we are saying. We can't be uh, below the pyramid. It, that should stop. And that can only happen if we are all, if we create a new identity, who is not Negro, he's mm. not quote-unquote black, he's not a quote-unquote American, he's not quote-unquote Igbo Yoruba. He transcends all of that. He is now carrying the power of Kush, Kemet, Mali, Benin. He's carrying all of these elements into him as one. He's a super, he's a super African, I would call him. <laughs> you see? He's a super African that you can't defeat. Indeed. Uh, you can't defeat. So he's a threat to Islam. He's a threat to Christianity. He's a threat to Arabs. So <laughs> if you speak Pan-Africanism, all Africans are with you. They say, Muhammad Gaddafi is our hero. Then you say, okay, slow down. Let's discuss Afrocentricity, your culture, your identity, and your history. They say, no, man, we can't do that. You know, when you <laughs> do that, then now we are going to attack the Arab and leave. Allah will be gone. Quran will be gone. Then what will happen to us? You know, then I say, you are not ready. You go to Arabia every year for your pilgrimage. They, you are not they, ready. Uh, they be mad at me when I, when I uh, discuss Allah. Not technically Allah, but the proto-Semitic L, which becomes Arabic Allah, is a borrowing from ancient Egypt uh, in, in terms of a reference for 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 deity. And we can we can we can we can prove this linguistically. Um, but you know, with that being said, I want to uh, thank you a thousand times. Uh, for coming on the Mbongi and uh, uh, sharing your wisdom and uh, and thank you all in the chat and and those who came on to uh, um, ask our guest um, these these questions and in in these comments to to expand the conversation and um, and of course all of you who are just watching live, or not watching live, you're, you're recapping the show uh, at, a, at a later time because uh, you had some other things to do. But we appreciate you now and later. And so um, I saw you you had your hand up. You wanted to say something? Yeah. Go ahead. There's a book you lift up that said Mutun, Mutun wa, wa, wa Zambi or something like that. Mutu wa Zambi. Yeah, because, you know, I speak several African languages. So I speak Hausa. The mutun there, what does it mean? Because in Hausa, it means a person. Yeah, muntu is uh, the general Bantu word for person. Oh. And so it is, it is muntu wa in zombie, uh, a portrait of human as God's special creation. And wow. so this is, this is uh, a text written by, that I published uh, on behalf of Dr. Chilimalema Mukinge. So I'm, 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 I'm moving in that direction of becoming a publisher so I can put this kind of information, you know, out there uh, uh, for us. So this is, you know, one of, this is my second uh, book. The first one is Prayer in Africa by Dr. Kalamba and Sapa. Uh, both of these individuals are Baluba speaking people out of the Democratic uh, of Congo. So we're actually working on a second book. It's a children's book. But this particular book here is talking about the, well, just Luba philosophy, religion and culture and, and language and, and the role of the human being uh, within that tradition in its relationship to uh, the divine and divinity. And he juxtaposed that, uh, that conversation with other African groups including the ancient Egyptians, so you can see the parallels, you know, in West yeah, it's, Africa. It's just, it's, it's, I just see the word, I'm like, this is a house of word for a man, you know, for Mutu. It, Mutu it, it's, it's, it's the yeah. same word. So remember um, that you mentioned Ma 
when, when, you, when you broke down uh, Madinka, right? Yes. Uh, Manding, right? And how it is the, you know, son of man or child of man, right? Yes. And my being human. So what that um, that ma for for human is a grammatical feature of the ancestral language that is still um, right. it still holds a grammatical function to this day. So when you see for in Bantu, they'll say mu instead of ma, right? And um, so it's prefixed just like it's prefixed there. Uh, but I think grammatically, I've seen a few words when I was looking in the dictionaries that is suffixed. And in Hausa, the 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 root is is two. And so ancestrally, it was suffixed to the root. So it was tum. But it became fossilized and they re-put the word, uh, the, the grammatical feature in the front, just like with what they did in your language. And so that's why it's Muntu, you know, but in 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 Bantu is Muntu. In ancient Egyptian, the T becomes R. And just like in Hansa, it was suffixed, the M. So that's how we get Ramech. So that's the, the word, how we say Ramech is the same as saying Mandinke. Like literally, because, um, but except the, the Ma, is um prefixed here and in the din meaning you know saying child is is the 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 center but it's it's functioning in the same way that um that the hasa was because there's an ancient word i mean an ancient grammatical feature that was uh suffixed to the the din which is just the in part of it or the in part of it for some who still say din but um but the root is two you know meaning to to um to to give birth to to be born sometimes it's just a word for human body and limb and then it becomes a word for phallus and then that's how you get the root you know to to produce wow. a child and it becomes child but they're all manding rome lomi rematch muntu muntu is all the same word you know, and and uh, I plan on writing a I, I wrote in a Luja volume two about this in the introduction, but um, I'm planning on now doing a a journal article, and and I want to I want to add that uh, that term you know to to the data structure. But yeah, that's that's all that means. It's the same word. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure no to be here. Well. Um, Thank each and every one of you again. You know, uh, I'll probably do a. No, I won't do nothing this coming weekend because I'll be in New York uh, for the International African Arts Festival. And but come the following week, you know, we should we should be back, you know, on schedule. So until next time, peace.